This is Wardrobe. We've got a live interview talk. I'm calling them fireside chats. Uh, I need labeled them that. So that's what we're calling them, the firesides from the old uh, Roosevelt fireside chats he used to do. And today we have someone on that you, many of you probably know. And let me uh, show you something here. I need to learn how to transition here all smooth and cool, but that's not the way we do it here at this channel, as, as we all know. So probably all know this channel, Modeling for Advantage, the Restless Kaiser and Johnny B and others. And he'll mention all the other hosts because I always forget their names. But I see Johnny B most of the time. Um, but we're going to be talking to the Restless Kaiser from Modeling for Advantage. Um, <clears throat> he does all kinds of cool stuff. He'll go into all the stuff they do, new games and uh, getting started, starter sets, which is why we're kind of talking to him specifically about that. He talks about all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, see, you see Warhammer, but we don't care about that stuff right now. But lots of bolt action and Flames of War and other things. And he, a couple of videos he just put out here is 2021 resolutions, hobby resolutions and tabletop ready painting, which we'll get to that here, you know, near to the end of our discussion today. Um, so everybody, uh, let's uh, welcome the Restless Kaiser, modeling for advantage. Hello there, folks. How is everyone tonight? Because Happy New Year to everyone, to you, Restless. Happy New Year, sir. How are you and yours then? We're good. I, my wife just popped in, said it's starting to snow, so it's a, it's a winter wonderland. Hmm. Where about are you? So we're in the middle of uh, the U.S. We are in uh, St. Louis area, St. Louis, Missouri area. And we have some people commenting. I just told you we could see all the chats, but I'm not seeing them on there. But we got Gun Barrel on here, my arch nemesis. They, ju they just pinged into my feed there. I can oh, see there them. they go. Bam. Boom. So, yeah. Yes, uh, Gun Barrel and I have gone, been going back and forth uh, for years. Um, we owe one of us owes someone two dollars. I don't know. It's from a movie. Um, right. Better off dead. So we, if you go back to my and his older stream, like older videos, years six, seven years ago, you see some really weird stuff going on there. Me crawling on a car asking for two dollars. Me putting, uh, hey, Rich John. Me putting models on a waffle. I don't even remember why, but I put them on a frozen waffle. That was how we based my model. I don't know. Don't ask me. The joke at the time, which is now lost on you. Yes, but it was hilarious. I'm sure. Um, so everybody, so what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to. I'm going to have. Uh, uh, I, I want to say Mr. Kaiser, Mr. Kaiser, not Restless Kaiser. Uber weird. Yes, yeah. we are. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about your channel. So why don't you give us a little bit of idea what the modeling for an advantage is, what it's about, kind of what you cover, how long you've been doing it why all that stuff welcome all viewing by the way just post comments in here so we know you're there so i can see jens from tabletop generals has just joined us just some great stuff oh yeah they do awesome stuff started the war at the beginning and he's planning to do all of it in english and german okay, guy, some targets speaking of resolutions um what what who am i what do i do that kind of thing then Tom. yeah that yeah yeah. Right. Um, yeah so i'm the restless kaiser i introduced most of my videos that way that's a bit of a old online gaming thing. I in, in the early days, sort of fifteen years ago, Kaiser was a name that I would use in online games and so forth. But once online gaming got a lot bigger, I'd tend to find a new game that name was taken, so I, I lengthened it to the Restless Kaiser, and uh, so that I could be consistent across the different online games that I played. It is my Johnny B just joined the chat there. Kaiser, Johnny B, only for you, John. Only for you. Um, uh, the channel that I uh, produce uh, is called Modeling for Advantage. Uh, I say produce because it's my channel, but there are lots of contributors. John Bachelor or Johnny B in there is my principal co-host, and I do most of my work with him. But there's a range of other guys, uh, including uh, Jim Otek and Clueless Mike. Uh, we've got a young lady called Charlotte who started doing some illustration videos on some of our some of our channel content. Uh, gosh, I'm now on the spot to remember uh, who I've said and who I've not said. You I feel see. awful. Jason from Battle Knights contributes and a few of the YouTubers like Harry from Fog of War and uh, Brush and Quill. Hello. Oh. And the, the content that we do, the games that we tend to play, we are not competitive gamers. We are people who, two idiots fumbling their way through a war game is probably the best way of describing our games. So I'll lean into that a little bit. We don't like to become overly familiar with a particular system. We move to new games all of the time. 
There's some old favourites. We play bolt action regularly. We do play Warhammer. I mean, a lot of the guys that I play with play Warhammer, so we have it on the channel. Um, but it's by no, it's not like it's half of our content. It's more like it's about a sixth or something. But we do do Warhammer. And one of the key things that we do, though, is we take starter sets, unbox them, and play that game. And then we escalate those games. And if we like them, we will continue to play them. But often, three, four games in, we're like, okay, we've had our fill out of that game. Let's look at doing something else. Cool. Modern for advantage. So uh, real quick, I do want to mention, um, we got a comment from uh, Rocky's War Room. This is Matt. So this is a channel you can find me on occasionally. Uh, he hosts all kinds of stuff. Many of you probably know him. But I wanted to bring him up because you mentioned something in our pre-show chat, not World War II related, but I do want to make sure that Rocky hears this. So what's a game you might be playing soon on your channel that you talked about? You mean as a direct result of watching Rocky's War Room live streams? Yes. Yeah, we, we're talking. We actually had the Facebook group conversation today about doing some Antares this year. Well, what a shame. What a shame. Johnny B's really interested in doing some battle monkeys in, you know, Power Armor. <laughs> well so matt from rocky's war room you have inspired yet another person he inspired uh, uh not jay on his channel to take it up and not jay is more of a world war ii star wars guy and uh yeah so that's pretty cool that um that's kind of why to me this is kind of why i do this stuff is i do want to inspire people to take up new um you know, new games and try things i have slowly started converting rocky's war room which is all miniatures groups into hex encounter games which is another thing I can talk about some other time. Like I got set up here. So it's like my evil little plan. <laughs> evil plan. But that's another thing altogether. So let's say Rocky did acknowledge that. So that's uh, pretty awesome. So it'll be fun to watch that on your channel. You guys will do fantastic with that, I'm sure. So as a caveat, I'm thinking it better just be bolt action with different shaped dice. Otherwise, we might not be so keen on it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, no, that's what's so good about it. Um, but I do want to say, though, but in the 2021 resolutions video you all just put out. Oh yeah. Johnny B only had like two, two things to do. So he's got lots of room to add Antares to it, to paint some models. Cause he had like a goal of like what, opening a paint bottle and gluing something together or something. What? I mean, it was pretty. It was slightly more ambitious than that, but he has given himself a whole year to paint three models. Okay. Well, Johnny B we're, we here, we're here for you. Jo John likes to think of his uh, approach to painting and building models as being comparable to World War II production methods, actually, as we're talking about World War II. So uh, he sees my approach to tabletop ready as being a generous term for how I paint, <laughs> as being a, a, a sort of US ally mass production approach to it. Whereas he sees his own works as like hand fabricated, you know, German Meister craftsman. Each piece is magnificent, but there aren't going to be many of them. Bentleys, Rolls Royce, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know. uh, Hey, Johnny B, I apologize. This isn't fair. You're not on here to defend yourself, but you can defend yourself in the comments. <laughs> of course he yeah. is. We'll Type do. it in the do for there. Um, all right. Do. So I do want to mention uh, we got uh, Hethwell on here. He's on here all the time. My channel popping on making comments, which I appreciate very much. And yes, this start way to start the new year. Um, a little chitty chat with the Restless Kaiser and Wardrobe. Oh, my goodness gracious. I was all getting excited about doing my first live show, and I've got some new stuff going on here in StreamYard, so I'm kind of distracted here. Um, oh, yeah, they are. I agree, uh, Tabletop Generals. They are very good. I forgot to. Here, let me um, – I'm going to put it on Restless here. So um, so let's talk about getting started. So what are – let's go – someone – you know, your channel seems to be a lot about – you know, you've played the Flames of War Hit the Beach starter set. You got it. You unboxed it. And then you put it together and you're playing some games with it. Same with Bolt Action Band of Brothers set like here. Like I'm going to get ready to do some uh, videos on. One, yeah. Um, not, yeah, not near as good or quick as you. But let's um kind of kind of talk through kind of like that part of your channel and what your thinking is there. And, you know, someone's getting on how do they get started. You know, it's a big topic. Yeah, uh, it is a big topic, and you just like oh, give the screen to me. Just talk to a Majerison, right? Um, what's the what's the thinking there? And partly, I think it's to reflect that as a channel, we're actually only eighteen months old. We're still sort of finding our feet, and we are trying a lot of games. But it's just um, for us when we when we're introducing a new game to the channel, it just seems quite logical to start at the beginning. It also helps. One of the things about YouTubing compared to just playing with your friends down a club or in home or whatever is you quickly realize 
that you don't know rule systems as well as you think you do because there's a lot of things that you'll just let slip don't really care a, an interesting one is for example something like pre-measuring pre-measuring allowed in this game some games it is some games it isn't but we know our opponents most but most people that i play with don't care about pre-measuring because it feels like a bit of a you know an unnecessary intrusion onto your ability to play the game other people do but as soon as you go on youtube you'll get somebody commenting saying, you can't pre-measure that really changes the tactics of the game and it does of course because in a game like ball action where you've got range hands as short as six inches and you've got movement rates of six inches and weapons with 12 and six inch range if you can pre-measure say well you i'll move up to just outside the six inch mark and i'll shoot at you where i'm optimum if you can pre-measure you can do that every time and if you can't you're rarely going to pull that off so it does change the way the game is played and i get that so anyway that was just an example but because of that one of the things i realized in the beginning of youtube was i needed to roll back a little bit rather than approaching the game systems like we know what we're doing we need to approach game systems like we don't know what we're doing oh. and we're gonna, we're, you, you're going to learn with us um and there's a lot of content on youtube out there that's quite that's quite aimed at the competitive side of play about meta list building and and really high level play and again, when you play a lot of systems, you just can't keep up with that. So I needed to find ourselves a bit more of a niche. Um, and so beginner casual games is very much what we're about. So we take a start set and we play it from the beginning and build up the armies from there based upon model availability and the sets that come out rather than you know going to great lengths to find some third party piece of awful resin because it's a really good unit in the game. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah, we won't do those things, but a lot, a lot of people do. Yep. Okay, so that's one thing I appreciate about the channel, but let me show a few of the comments. We have 19 people watching, which is awesome. We appreciate you all popping on here. At Mad Dog says, Happy New Year, mofos, which I appreciate. Thank you. Uh, maybe Johnny B could come on your channel, Matt. I bet he could. You could probably pay the Kaiser a little bit of a finder's fee to let him come on your channel for a second. Oh, Johnny B is 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 for hire for the face. Absolutely. Okay, beautiful. Um of a john the baptist look now because of the corona thing though he's not he's not shaved in a year now i think that's 2020 i know we're in 2021 but we'll see some uh, bleed over here so we got duncan fx on there hey thanks for popping on here appreciate that um uh yep so that's all we got coming on there so thanks all for popping on it's been great um so oh there's a new one charla charles latora afternoon afternoon sir i assume Lattice james Oh, here's another good one. This is a great the Sol World War II Solitaire board game channel. So I like the focus, obviously, and he does board games solo. I think you've even written your own, haven't you? Uh, World War II Solitaire board game channel. I think he wrote some of his own rules, but he plays a lot of those that are designed for solo. So Rocky, definitely go check him out. R Rocky's been getting into solo uh, board games. Um, he's one of the ones I'm converting over. So um, welcome. We appreciate you. Glad you're here. Maybe we can convert you to some solo miniature gaming. So, um, so one thing that, like he said, they, what they do so great on their channel is they, they get the band of brothers box starter set, like I said, and they don't, they, what I, what I appreciate is the non-competitive play. So can we talk about that real quick in case somebody, I mean, I can tell by the people watching here that most of these people know what, you know, competitive and non-competitive mean, but again, kind of want to keep in the, the realm that for an, for a noob. So what do you, what do you mean by that? You're not competitive players. You don't want to win the game. I know you want to smash Johnny B into the ground. Yeah, so th there's different ways of winning a game, though, isn't there? There's winning a game by making better decisions um, in the game. There's winning a game by rolling more sixes, which is the method I prefer, to be honest. The most interesting games that you will ever play, the most fun games, not the most interesting games, are when on the final round, two units clash at the end of the round, and there's a dice roll off. Somebody gets a, t gets a six, and both players cheer. You know, that's yeah. what you're trying to recreate. That's when you know you're both invested in a shared experience that you're both enjoying. And that's the 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 objective of casual play is to have fun. The objective of competitive play is to win the game. And they're not the same thing at all. That's not to say that I don't enjoy winning and that I don't, you know, get maybe it says cheer on the grumpy side when I lose. <laughs> but fundamentally, I'm not coming at this game trying to leverage every possible aspect of this game and this system to my advantage to increase my chance of winning. 
Um, so in terms of competitive play, the big difference you're going to find is around list building. Yeah. All the person brings to the table. And this is something completely against the idea of playing a starter set. The units in the starter set are very unlikely to be competitive. They may be common, they may be thematic, but they won't necessarily be very good. Yep. So, yeah, in a competitive game, you're likely to have, in terms of historical games, very heavily leveraged armies or force group composition, which has no relationship to what was actually used in history, but which is likely to perform very well on the table. Ball action is a game that you've been talking about recently. Good example of ball action is people bringing field art, uh, not just field artillery, but heavy artillery to a platoon sized action. Yeah. So if you play a game like, um, is it Chain of Command, the Lardy game? Same, same, yeah. You're lucky to see a mortar on the table. Mm -hmm. In in battle, in um, ball action, in, in a competition, you're going to have people with eight inch howitzers on the table, but only 20 men. Yeah, yeah. And same with Flames of War. You see stuff that's too big for that area. Someone, yeah. uh, McMurray, who's always on. Um, on uh, Rocky's War Room, he's a local guy here. He doesn't have his own channel, but um, he talks about that, like the scale of a you know Flames of War tables only. Gosh, it's really like 200 yards or something like that, or two football, yeah, yeah. four football fields maybe in American you know soccer field, whatever. And it's like you would never have even some games like Disposable Heroes, which is an interesting concept. You barely have heavy machine guns on the table, and they're off board, and you have beaten zones, and so mm -hmm. you're like you can like aim it. I don't remember all the specifics, but you can aim it from any, you know, you're on this board side and you can aim through there and you can pretty much hit anything on the board because that's pretty accurate. Now you have, do have cover and stuff, but, um, and what's interesting is that beaten zone concept. I didn't think anything of it. And I thought, well, that's an interesting name. I was watching a World War II training video, one of those you can find on YouTube. And they said, if you look here, because they were shooting at water, you know, a German machine gun, they were shooting at water. And they said, it was an American video. If you look here, you can see the beaten zone of the machine gun because they so they use the water to illustrate the yeah. you know, let's flying. I was like, oh, I love it. That's what I love about the people that create these games. Many of them, you know, they're they're historians, you know, either either professional or amateur. So that's pretty cool to see that. Let me um, put some comments up here. So I like what Rich John said, and I think that's a Jeep on here. I love Jeeps. What makes their game so watchable is the banter and attitude. No power playing. I agree, hundred percent. And um, you know, thank you for the kind words. Of course. So uh, Heathwell says starter packs are the best way for a newcomer and a friend to get started. They share the cost. Yep. And the load to paint as well. Um, what is your take on miniature agnostic systems for newcomers? That's a great question. Um, well, let's go ahead and cover it. You ask it. Let's cover it right now. So I've got some ideas. What's your thoughts on those? Um, well, it's, it's interesting how, you know, I'm not a young man, um, so I've, I've been I've been around for a little while, and miniature agnostics systems is is a fairly unfamiliar concept to me. I mean, it's not that I've not heard the terms, not like I don't know what it means, but it's a relatively new idea in terms of the hobby. I come from an age where people wrote rule systems but didn't make miniatures, and indeed there was no there was no real relationship between the two. I'm not saying that people would play model romans and say that they were space marines although people would do that uh, back in the day but the idea that these particular miniatures are associated with this particular system that's a, that's a really a games workshop idea that's just started to to migrate to other people claims of war of course ball action uh, both do that but so the games like war machine where they they try and make their their story unique enough that other people's models no longer fit I'm a big fan of miniature agnostic uh, approach to wargaming, but that doesn't mean that I often use miniatures from different companies, not because I don't want to, but because they often they don't fit with the collection that I often have because of the starter box approach that we go with. Yeah. That makes so, so if I bought Flames, I didn't just buy the rule books. I Spot, spot star sets where you got you know two armies in flames of war i'll use them at their miniatures because they fit yeah so my thought on that hath well is this this is how i started actually was uh, uh model agnostic systems because i'm trying to think uh well i wouldn't have gotten i don't think i'm not sure bolt action was around when i started um i'm not that long into the hobby but flames of war is definitely out and i didn't i always tend to choose the things that aren't the popular things it's a, I, I have to talk to my psychologist about that, but um, 
I always want to do the the other thing. And from what I know of Flames of War, because I'm not a competitive player, I'm not a tournament player. And I think I thought at the time probably that that's kind of what you had to do with that one. I probably didn't really realize you could play it however you want, right? But that might have been one thing. And I just wasn't sure what scale. I didn't want to do 15s. I wanted to do six, whatever. I don't know. Um, and the rules I had played were command decision um, with a group of local people here, which is an agnostic, you know, I mean, you can play it in any scale, often played in 15 here locally. Um, so that's kind of was my introduction to it. So I just started searching for rules, kind of focused on the size of game I wanted to play. So I was really used to playing uh, tactical war game, board war games, like like advanced squad leader, it wasn't that one, but like it where each counter is yeah. a squad. Yeah, yeah. Right, and it was basically a company against company though, in those games they go way bigger, like ASL especially. But, but anyway, that's what I was used to and I like that scale because I can imagine a squad of soldiers, 10 people, I can picture that in my mind. You start getting me like brigades and regiments and I'm like, I don't, it's hard to picture that and how that even works, you know? Like how do you even move 10,000 yeah. people? I found that really interesting, though, because I'm totally opposite to that. Although because of the size and scope of the games we play, I often play skirmish games. In terms of immersion, I find it a lot more difficult to grasp the the, the, the way that, that we're playing the game. The god mode nature of playing a war game is that I, this model is going to do this, and it's going to 100% do that because I want it to. That, to me, is so much more understandable and credible if you're talking about divisional level tokens, that I am Eisenhower and I am saying this division is going to attack Arkan on Friday, that's credible. But if I'm playing a platoon level action or a squad level action, say, I can't make John do that because that's dangerous and he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> right. Do, on some level, that guy is 90% autonomous, 10% directed, but the division. That's 90% directed, 10% autonomous. Right. So for me, and an immersion thing, hmm. I find that. And actually, it's a bit of a, an issue for me in games in general. I think we often, we've read about stuff. So we've looked at tactical and battlefield type operations, uh, uh, type events, and then operational stuff, and then theater level stuff grand strategy and we tend to try and put all of them into a war games table i see this a lot and saying anything when you start talking about outflanking or cutting off supplies and so forth we all know they're really important in war saying that's not happening on the tabletop that's happening on an operational level that's what happened before we got to the battle that made a battle happen here under right different you know under different circumstances we wouldn't be fighting here that is what made the scenario we are now playing yeah right so that's, that's perfect um so so just real quick back to the so that's how i started was agnostic because i was looking for squad that's why I, flames war was interesting to me because it's kind of that level sort of but so i picked up my very first game i thought i had a cover to it but i don't it's just one of those i bought pdf but it's called mine panzer was my very first game i ever bought and the cool thing about it, it's, it's very chart driven. It's a little bit more old school, probably, you know, early 2000s kind of game. I mean, look at these charts here. I mean, it's this, it's, it's pretty oh, awesome. Right. They go into a lot of detail. It's not tactics or anything. It's not tactics, but, but the cool thing about it, just a real side note about Mind Panzer is that you can play basic and then you, they have them, they call them module add ins and they're all a part of the rules. So you can add in uh, command and control. You can add in fog of war. So you can add in stuff, which is pretty cool. You can add in more detailed tank stats if that's what you want in your game. So that was the very first one I bought because I thought I just want to buy six mil. What do I play? So, but then my second one that I bought, they say it's always your first, but this was in taste. It was my second was Blitzkrieg commander. And I just yeah. discovered it by just doing what we all do and browsing the web, looking for games. And I liked the support that the guy gave the original author. It's owned by Pendraken now. And they're doing a good job of it, but um, the original guy, um, Peter Jones, I believe his name was, he had his own site and I didn't know how he even managed that, but he great forum on there, great support. So I jumped in there. It's a tougher way to get involved because you like this one, they don't tell you about army formations. They don't tell you about anything. You got to kind of, you got to do the work. And a lot of the old grognards are like, that's how I did it. You had to do the work yourself. And I hate flames of war because they spoon feed you. I'm like, dude. Why make it hard? You know, I mean, 
-hmm. So I, that attitude has most definitely changed for the most part, I think. I think people are okay with the concept of kind of feeding a little bit because that, I mean, but I, I got in and started that journey and here I am and I love it and it's all great. So I guess my, to answer your question, Hethwell, is it's a way to do it and it gives you a lot of freedom. And the cool thing about World War II, and I always want to emphasize this to people because, and I have people, I hear people ask this. We just had someone ask us recently, can I use such and such miniatures for bolt action? You can use whatever you want for bolt action. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and you, you, I definitely want to clear that out of people's minds. So if you buy those Flames of War minis and you base them, like these are some I bought from somebody, paint, but if you base them like that, you're like, well, I don't want to play Flames of War anymore. I guess I better sell them and buy some others to, you know, to single base. Screw that noise. Use this yeah. thing and just mark them off. And That's the one area where you might run into trouble, though, isn't it? Is basing. I mean, basing is a is uh, a real uh, generator a rabbit hole. More games. Um, but I did um, I thought show and tell since yep. we mentioned future agnostics, and I do tend to tend to stick within the the scale that the game was intended. Um, but a good example of looking at that and thinking, well, this isn't going to work for me is Black Powder. I wanted to do some American Civil War stuff for a while. Um, but twenty eight mil American Civil War just doesn't work for me. It's like my 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 house is not big enough to fit <laughs> yeah. twenty eight mil, let alone my spare room. Um, so I started looking at other options, and actually, we've got some. These are. Ooh, can you see them? It's Calistra Confederate Cavalry. Are they mm -hmm. showing? Up okay? Yeah, they're showing up pretty good. Yeah. So these are these are actually 10, 12 mil from Calistra. Um, not at all the scale in which Black Powder was intended to be fought in. But we played a few tester games recently. Uh, you know, just over Zoom and what have you, and it, it works just fine. But the important thing about basing a miniature size is that. You, they're the same as what your opponent is going to use. Right. So if I'm using 28 mil World War II figures, you need to be using 28 mil. It doesn't matter if I'm using Black Tree and you're using Warlord. Correct. But it does matter that we're both 28 mil and we're both broadly on the same base size. Right. That I would agree with. Yeah. So when I was doing my series, I, I kind of mentioned that, but you also, you know, I was really trying to be super flexible. Like, you know, I don't want to be too prescriptive to anybody, man. It's your game. You play it how you like. But yeah, it's good to, it's good to stick to a scale to scale at a minimum. And then I think World War II is a little less concerning with basing, in my opinion. Now, if it's tough if you're bringing that against single base 15s, but it's doable. I think when you talk about Civil War and any kind of rank and flank thing, I think it's definitely more important. And it also yeah. depends on the rules on how you like when you close assault. But um but let's look at a couple of comments here real quick uh, from the back. So story over result. Yep, that's kind of what we're talking about. Oh, I did want to mention, um, I don't know what this means. I'm just going to just put it there and then get it off there because I don't know what that means. <laughs> so ID Jester, uh, great channel. He just, he does sports and fantasy and <laughs> war gaming. No min-max attitude, agreed. Um, he, plays, he plays counter games. They've got the min and the max on the counter, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I think, um, you know, uh, Matt, you know, we he, he definitely is a, we like to play story. We've been playing a lot of games on his channel um, and on Jay Wiley's channel. It's a game I mentioned called Bigger Battles. But Jay Wiley, it's a complete sandbox game. So this even goes even further back like Hethwell was talking about. So like Blitzkrieg Commander is a World War II rule set, right? So it's designed to be World War II, whereas something like Bigger Battles um, uh, is... You can play anywhere from ancients to, you know, space marines, um, copyright. Uh, so so it's it's a sandbox, but you can play World War II with it. And I have, and it was pretty awesome. So that's another way that you can get started. Like, I don't know, maybe you don't even know if you want to play World War II. Now, the problem with that is just like we we're talking about more work. You do have to do the work to give it some stats. But you know, he's got some basics built out for you and you can ask, you know, there's a community. So ask people, but uh, Matt, I think you used to play competitive. Like, well, I think if you play Warhammer, you play competitive, but I think you, Matt used to play that ancients ago. We don't need to get into that. He's got some, it's messy. He doesn't like, but, but, um, but he used to play that, but now Matt is definitely a narrative storytelling now with wild West games. And it's so, yeah, we have a lot of fun, you know, telling stories and all that. So <laughs> let's see what uh, world War solitaire got here. Um, excellent perspective. That's how I play most games. I enjoy the narrative and losing can sometimes feel better than winning if it fits the narrative. Yeah. 
Um, well, especially, you know, that's why I like playing solo because I always win and I always lose. So it's both. Uh, what do I else got to get here? Got lots of comments. I appreciate you all commenting on here. It's uh, it's uh, good. <laughs> yeah, here we go. History has no copyrights. And I think that's a struggle for history uh, games, right? <laughs> Because like, you know, especially like uh, version three Flames of War, man, they, I'm not saying they covered everything because they, there was big gaps, I'm sure, but they covered a lot and they had a lot of stuff. But at some point it's like, well, where do you go? <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can only produce so many Sherman variants. There weren't that many, really. So it's like, how do you, so that makes Sherman variants. You need some more books, Todd. There's about a hundred. Well, okay. But you know what I'm saying? Come on. It needs to be a pro to tell the difference, mind. Yeah, well, true. And then that's when you can get into something else. Like, oh, that's the wrong Sherman. Like, oh, okay, sorry. Let's see what... Uh, oh, oh, I got to let me go back here a little bit. I'm kind of getting behind here. This is awesome. Um, morale rules. Yeah, see, and I never play with the morale rules, but you can add them on. So that's pretty cool. Mad Dog, it's cool to see someone else has played Mein Panzer. Oh, there aren't very many. Um, that's another thing. When I was doing that uh, series, how many rules are out there? You know, like... Holy mackerel, there's so many rules. And I didn't even list them all. I mean, there's no way. Like, you on the War Game Vault, forget it. Um, and the ones that are no longer, I'll say, dead, meaning they're not printed anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true, John. But it makes painting easy. Going to jump into BKC4 later this year. Oh, yeah, modeling for advantage. That's right. And have enough 10 mil left for some tiny chain of command. Oh, you're a you're brave soul. 10 millimeter chain of command. That's pretty cool. But I have seen people do it and it looks pretty awesome. Uh, let's see here. It was born on the table in the two E as a rank and file empire swordsman. He went through the, the empire. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome. Yep. That's cool. Good story. Yeah. I've taken a mini and kind of having a gross. So people who've been playing minis for a long time. So, um, so you're 18 months in as a YouTuber, uh, Kaiser, but how long you've been playing? Oh, well, you know, that's one of them conversations, isn't it? When precisely did it begin? Um, was it was it watching the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon when I was like six or seven, possibly? Mm -hmm. But certainly in terms of those really, really early memories, I was I don't I couldn't tell you the first the order in which all of those things happened, but certainly by the time I was in middle school which would be like 10. I had the Dungeons and Dragons red box set that I was that I was playing indoors, you know, when the when all of the the rough kids were outside in the playground. Yeah. I was indoors with my paper and my 20-sided dice awesome. tracing the artwork from that uh, red book. Um, and that was an interesting story in and of itself really because uh, this is just really old school stuff, but um, the local pub as in, you know, a place where you buy beer yeah this is this is getting on for 40 years ago now they are, they put like a penny on the price of the beer for a month because my i come from quite a poor working class background um you put a penny on the price of the beer and they bought all the kids of all the families of the people that use that pub amazing christmas presents and took us on holiday for one year uh it was just wow. some that they did and of course so what happened was that members of this pub staff were suddenly given like what's your kid into they don't really know and they had to go and try and find them that presence that they just wouldn't normally be able to afford so i've got this really mixed haul from the local hobby shop of of like some battle tech stuff a dungeons and dragons starter set some ninjas <laughs> it was just and it was like this stuff is all amazing. I didn't even know this shop existed, but somebody else had put the time and the effort into getting me started. Wow. So I think that's probably where that, where that came from. I think that's I was a cool story. story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and I don't know whether you see those kind of things. That sort of that sense of community spirit. Um, mm. You know, I mean, can you, they could do that in the supermarket, right? So we've got food banks in the UK because we've got a real poverty crisis at the moment. So yeah. we'll say this could put a penny on the price of a loaf of bread and probably solve this problem in a heartbeat, but no one would like that. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a pretty cool thing though. I mean, so that's, so that just kind of started the, the dungeon and dragon and those miniatures kind of got you fuel and you just kind of have grown. So you've been playing kind of off and on since then. Yeah, different different types of games at different play points. So that was that played a lot of role playing with kids at school because it's really low equipment equipment low. Or certainly was then. 
Um, and then uh, miniature gaming played down the local war games club with people who would let a sort of 12, 13 year old play with their figures. So that was the guys who played games that nobody else wanted to play, like Star Grun, uh, when everybody else was playing Warhammer, you know, like some John Tuffley game or um, something like that. And then didn't really miniature game at university and then got back into it again, maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. Okay. I can do it more, more seriously. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Mad Dog, I think that is where they're uh, located down there. And they could use some more. Uh, this is the people that produce Mind Panzer in a uh, naval war game. Are they general quarters, I think? Anyway, um, this is a good one here. It all began in the backyard sandbox when I was eight and didn't mind using cat poop as trench lines. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have did that right. You were drinking that drink there. You might have spewed That's on the computer. Right. But yeah, exactly. You use what I mean. I had Airfix figures when I was a kid, and you know, I just thought those were the coolest. You know, they're so much better than those just army men that you bought those green yeah. jank things that were. And yeah, before that, I'd done Airfix kits where you you know your fingers stick to it, and there's just strings of plastic glue everywhere. Fingerprints um, on the yeah, model. Yeah. The, the clear canopy was totally cut, you know, glazed over. Right. Uh, and before that, lined up little army men and flicked them over with my, you know, friend from next door when I was very young. I've done, yeah. I've done all that as well, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I um again. Yeah, I I just and I never used any rules. I so I and I would also go to the library in the city town where I was from and get um, Featherstone and um, uh, Donald Featherstone and who is he? Charles Grant books mm -hmm. and look at these pictures, usually black and white, of these you know typically Napoleonic type of era because those look really good in pictures but the, i mean but if you look at their tables nowadays i mean you look at their tables in relation to nowadays man their tables were super simple for the most part right i mean it was i mean the hills were just kind of bronc and they had like two trees for a forest and they're building for a city and but i still thought man that is the coolest thing but i also thought there's no way i can do that i don't even know i don't i, I don't even know how to do that because there was I didn't know anybody. I was kind of a recluse kid. Like, who can imagine? I play solo games as an adult. But um, so you didn't build yourself a papier mache war games board then with poster yeah, paper. No, no. I oh, bought you missed something that you need to do that. <sighs> I don't know about to, that, man. Put square and you have your little airfix army men on it. That's you awesome. Need, you definitely need to do that. Look at all the space behind you. you can do that. Yeah, I got tons of room. Yeah. Yeah. but it anyway, I did fire fist figures, and I, I just would like. And I would buy the 172nd scale models and I would build them. And I, I don't even think I painted them because I was like, I can't paint them because I would get like scale modeling magazine, right? Well, who can paint like that, right? <laughs> I mean, those people yeah. are artists. So I just wouldn't do it. And what's so funny, like I said, and I mentioned this in my video, when I was like 40 or something and my friend was painting up his uh, Space Hulk minis because he <laughs> used to play Warhammer in college, but then he realized he needed to pay for college and have a life. Um, he got out of it, but he saw that skill set in his mind. So he thought, oh, I'm going to paint these Space Hulk minis. And as I watched him paint, and this always sounds weird, but I realized, oh, it's not that hard, really. I mean, it's, it, you know, to to just apply paint is not that hard. Just to put yep. it on and yep. it can look good. Um, and not that his look bad, but it can look good without much effort, really. I mean. Yeah. And you probably were stung a bit as a kid where you've tried to paint something with an inappropriate brush with a tin of enamel paint that nearly melted your brain through your nostril. You didn't know what you were doing. You had no guidance on this. So you, popped up in the paint, the soul syrupy at the bottom, clear at the top. You dipped it in, you tried to, and it looked awful. Yeah, yeah. And that, and, and and that's you, what you think painting Mont is going to be like in the 21st century. You're not going to want to do it. But it's not like that at all, is it? There's no. so much information about that, how to do it. Yeah. One, no, that well, that paint, don't use that stuff. Modern paints are so much better than that. Cheap brushes are still better than probably what you were using from a watercolor set that you had, like you know, like a, a vinyl yeah. brush as a kid. Whatever, just just yeah, have that, a hundred percent. Just do it. Testers enamels. What I'd always use those little glass bottles. Mm. Anyway, John uh, John Longshore Airfix and Roco tanks. Yep, that's right. Uh, things come and go. Um, that's true. It's uh. I remember the, the the hobby shop that I would go to, and of course my mom had to drive me there because it was twenty miles away or whatever. But it was it it, it was only board games, and it was right. to me to me it was I oh, mean it was a great shop. This one guy ran it all the time. I can't imagine that guy made any money. But well, back in the day though, there was some pretty good sales actually of war games and other games.
but I just remember the Avalon Hill victory Games section. I mean, I just would be like, Whoa, this is fantastic. I mean, it was the coolest store possible. Um, and I'm sure there were people playing games around me, but I just didn't, didn't, uh, didn't reach out. Yeah. yeah. Um, then you could get airfix kits in news agents and supermarkets and, yeah. you know, um, gift shops in museums, you know, they were everywhere, weren't they? Not, not, not like today. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is a good point, Hethwell. So kind of along the lines of getting started. So, you know, we talk about starter sets and those are, I still think those are good ways to get going. Now the, the problem is it's, there's the, the two main ones that we talk about are they're German and Americans. And a lot of people don't want to, well, you're going to have to have Germans at some point. They're the main baddies, but um, you may not like, you might want to play British. I mean, that's honestly where I'm kind of at. I've got British airborne. I want to kind of play some of the British battles because I hear about American stuff all the time. But um, so that's a challenge with it. And that's why I would suggest to someone to go and, uh, well, I guess you wouldn't have to go a miniature agnostic. Um, but that's another, a reason to not buy a starter set because it's like, well, you're buying a lot of stuff you don't want. I mean, so, um, but you can look, let's be honest. If you're going to get into the hobby, you're eventually going to want American army, even if you want to play British right now. <laughs> So maybe, I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, it's really interesting, the, the cultural difference there, because if you speak to a UK World War II figure manufacturer, they tell you they sell two Germans for every one of everything else combined. Mm -hmm. um, the overwhelming majority of people who play World War II in the UK have a German army and something else. Well, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that, uh, 100%. <laughs> but I guess I was thinking like, what if I don't want to play American? You know, it's like, well, I guess. I mean, you mean the, you start a box, right? I'm with you. Yeah, you don't want, yeah. you don't want the contents to start box. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose, I suppose that that's a, a question that I don't really, haven't really wrestled with, and that's one of the things about coming back to miniature gaming when you're a bit older and a bit more established in life. Um, this to come across as sounding a bit dickish, but. When you're 15, 20, 25, the cost of modeling and uh, model games feels very high. It feels like a lot of money in relation to the amount of money that you have. Uh -huh. Whereas by the time you've got a you know a job and a mortgage and you're a bit further on in life and you've had a couple of children, you're a bit more financially stable, the 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 cost benefit and how much of your disposable income that really is has maybe changed that relationship a bit. So the idea of having something that isn't buying the box for the box learn the game experience feels more worth it than worrying about whether i need these models afterwards okay. i'm not saying the value of the contents so much as the proposition of, of learning the game does that make sense yeah no 100 percent. that's a great point i mean like i said i got started in 40 right so i was kind of at that point where it's not that and i've always taken because i'm solo i've always thought i got to build both armies I want yeah. to build. I want to build both armies because I want to be able to play um, both. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So back to your birthday to do it. <laughs> What's that? You don't have to wait until it's your birthday to do it. Of course, you, know I mean? you can budget for it. But... Yeah. 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 Um, well, and so there is this whole thing about, um, especially if you're like we're talking about, if you're younger, um, you can't necessarily just go buy a bunch of buildings and trees and forests and stuff. You got to do it yourself. And that's, and that's a cool thing about the hobby is you can really do it fairly inexpensively, relatively speaking. And also don't compare yourself to other channels or other things you're seeing at all. Just please don't do that because you have no idea what their, their, you have no idea what their life is. Right. I mean, you could be watching somebody that's kind of independently wealthy and they don't have to work as far as you know. And they're like, man, they're always like, you don't know or they can afford to pay someone to do it. So it's hard to, you definitely don't want to do that, um, get in that trap, although we all do it, right? Yeah. yeah. But from that money perspective, though, that's, I think, one of those areas where where the, the less competitive you are as players, the less that matters. The, the more competitive you approach your gaming, the more you have to chase certain armies, certain units at a certain time. And you end up pouring money into chasing the meta. Whereas if you're just playing for the game experience, you're perfectly happy with the units that came in the starter box. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. And that's, a, I would say that's a, well, it's somewhat an advantage of not being competitive player because you're not always trying to build that latest list. But then again, the one reason I, it's a struggle I've had and I still struggle with a little bit when you're 
buying it like I do, like historic and all that. It's like, what do you buy? I mean, there's like a million things you can buy. And if you look at the, you know, any army list in any book, I mean, most of this Blitzkrieg commander book is army lists. And I don't mean lists in like, but it's just like, what did the British army have in Italy? I mean, a lot of it's repeats, of course, but there's a lot of crap in here. <laughs> so it's like, what do I, what do I get? What do I focus on? My, my best modeling times is when I had a convention game that I had to get ready and do it. And I was able to, you know, I, ha I had to do it because I, I had made a commitment. And we can talk about that, about the 2021, you know, what we want to see happen in 2021. Um, Cause I, I kind of hopefully doing that again. So, so there's mad dog there. Let's see what else we got. This isn't also an option. Yes. Just play everything, every scale. P Bacchus says, you know, you're going to have 10 scales anyway. So just, you know, deal with it. Um, Oh, oh, that's just wrong, but, but probably accurate. Um, let's see here. I, I haven't even pre-read these comments. I should probably do that before I post them up here, but let's see. Um, <laughs> okay. I like the next one. There's always that one. Um, yeah, that's accurate as well. Um, relatively to yeah. how team, relatively. Somebody mentioned Leto Vorbeck, though. Uh, Leto Vorbeck's assault on the African Queen. Hey, there's some there's some uh, historical pedigree for you there. Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. Leto Vorbeck. Um, all right, you know, well, let's talk about, so... Wait. What's that? Uh, Catherine Hepburn and... Oh, I forget who the guy is. Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart, Africa Queen, yeah. Yeah. That's loosely based on the First World War in German East Africa, modern-day Tanzania. Oh, very loosely based on it. <laughs> there was a situation because I love this story, by the way, is why I want to talk about it. It's totally unrelated to what we're doing. And so it's a German colony in 1914. The other German African colonies are overrun within about 12 months. But this chap, this German colonel, Leto Vorbeck, puts up a fairly rugged defense. Um, it's one of the greatest um, recorded military disasters, was our first attempt to invade. Um, was it Dar es Salaam? Tanga, Tanga. We tried to make an amphibious landing. It's a complete disaster. And he fights for two years in German East Africa. And then he retreats out of German East Africa and finds this guerrilla war. He actually surrenders a couple of days after the armistice. He's still, he's still fighting. Mm. And it's not more of a story about man against environment. It really is about the battles. But it begins with some pitch battles. It's also the the kind of proving ground of Jan Christian Smuts, who would go on to be one of the South African um, presidents and a man of great fame. He's the, is he the air minister? He's part of the Committee of Imperial Defense in World War II, but you know, in Britain, huh. he's a South African. So it's a really important people involved in this campaign. And they're really good stories about people just doing stupid things in difficult environments and then improvising. Wow, cool. Is he, does he play, is he come up in the movie at all? I don't know. I haven't seen that movie in ages. I, I can't remember. I think it's more the fact that they're, they're, they're there. I got you. I okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's this say here? <laughs> yeah. I hope that's true. Well, you were the one that was talking about World War II and then was on about your personal struggle, which I think maybe the title of a certain book. Oh, well, geez. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all right. Well, let's get back. So we've talked about starter sets and kind of getting started and, you know, uh, it's, um, but let's talk now about um, some of the extra stuff. So having the minis, right. Buying this box set and, you know, starting to yeah. build these, build these guys up, right. Is one thing. Yeah. And, but you, you need something to fight over or fight for. Right. So um, right. let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about that. Terrain, about tables. Terrain, tables, whatever. Yeah. I think the biggest, the first major obstacle that you may be not entirely prepared for as a new war gamer is the is the importance of having a play space, of having a war game, having a table, or having some terrain. And even if you're playing like, you know, 10 years old on your kitchen table with the guy from next door with airfix models, you still want terrain. Um, and it's really going to change your game experience. Very few starter kits come with any. And I think that that is something that they're starting to wake up to. You just got the bolt action kit. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Two sprues of scenery. I think it transformed the value of that kit to a genuine game experience. Immensely. Immensely. Especially if you're new to that scale. But that particular scenery that you've got there, there's very little of it, but it's a nice little piece in the middle of the board to fight over that's going to break up the battlefield a little bit. It actually makes two small, doesn't it? One like you've got there and one really tiny demolished. Yeah, a, a ruins. Yeah, yeah. Like and, any and, high ruins. Yeah. yeah. And especially when you uh, glue it incorrectly, but let's not talk about that. I'll cover that in the video. Um, no with it, so you're allowed to make mistakes. Yeah, I do want to step back real quick before we get too far in the comments here. But tabletop generals, and I don't remember if you talked about this when we were there. I think when they started, but so you know they're they're going through the whole war, right? I mean they're going through. Yeah, so that's kind of what he's talking about here. And then um, it is cool. Um, it is pretty awesome. You know, I'm not a, I'm not this kind, but most people, many people like huge tanks, right? They like the big tanks and they want to go big cats and, you know, fighting the Pershings against the whatevers. But what's cool, I, I, I'm more of a combined arms, more infantry than armor is my preference. I'm top. You're an infantryman. I guess. But yeah. Um, so I like to think of myself as a general, you know, someone uh, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm an idea man. So anyway. Um, I wear a robe for crying out loud. So then, um, but what's cool is if you, about World War II, and you know, it's an amazing story. If you start in even before '39, if you start over in you know Russo-Japanese Second War, um, yeah, if you start off in that, the the development of the weapon systems and even some of the tactics and army structure is pretty cool. So you really have a really huge journey going here and uh, tabletop generals you know they do i i can barely get videos out in in my in my native tongue of english these guys are putting videos out i believe in german and english um i'm not going to say i'm mad at you for doing good stuff but you guys pff, forget it but anyway go check out tabletop generals they're really good i'm subscribed and when it comes up deutschland i just i sometimes i'll even watch them in german just to kind of see okay because if i know the rules i kind of can follow along a little bit and, you know, when they say dice, I'm like, oh, and I'm sorry, I butchered, uh, you know, Deutschland. Anyway, um, yes. I think it's about order food and drink in Germany, which is a really useful skill. Yeah, there you go. My son took four years of it. Um, too many scales is my middle name. Um, oh, yeah, there you go. Ice and fire delivered to the commission payroll. That's a, that's a good way to do, uh, ice, you know, some games. I have paid people. So if you're getting into it and you do have some extra income, like, you know, I get it, you know, like if I budget right. I have paid a couple people to paint and um, it's fantastic. I mean, cause they're so much better and, <laughs> and they get done. So if, if you can, I, I like that. Some people like painting, but go ahead, sir. I was just going to say on the subject to commission painting. So this is again, you know, in dangerous than that something like the hobby is a really expensive thing. If you're going to pay a commission painter, you should expect to pay at least five pound a figure. And that's going to vastly increase the cost of your hobby. But by this, this commission painters, and then there's, your mate who doesn't have some money or wants these models, maybe you can swap the other half of the models from the starter kit and paint your figures, for example. Yeah. There are other ways of thinking about how you might be able to get some of your figures painted by somebody else other than just going to a website and paying five to ten pound a figure. Yeah, you well, people in your hobby community who will do some of that work for you in exchange for models. Yeah, well, that, that is true. I mean, that... <laughs> let's most people like like the you know some of the guys i've talked about that i know around here the the idea concept to them of playing solo miniature games is just mind-blowing like i don't even know how you do it and that's and honestly that's pretty more accurate that's really the mainstream because they're designed for two players or more and i get that i'm kind of the oddball um but um you really can do a lot if you come together as a community a local community and because I've heard this before. Some some guys love building terrain and painting them. Good, cool. Todd, you do the terrain. Kaiser, you do the models. Johnny B does the tanks. You know, Matt does the <laughs> forests. And you, if you do that, because everyone's got, got their interests, or maybe I love building the models, but I hate painting them. Well, cool. Give them to me to build. I give them to you to paint. So I've heard a lot of people do that. I just don't do that necessarily. Um, I think the problem is we all like buying the models, and we all don't like some of the steps between then and playing the games. Amen. I mean, I got to tell you, I, I, I didn't we start talking about terrain? What happened to that conversation? We'll get back to it. Yeah. Building these bolt actions, you know, first of all, I, I've already 
pr uh, preached it a million times. I would pay someone to paint my army and build my train if I could afford it. So the thought of building and putting a head on a dude and a hand and a gun and maybe even his little knife, you know, it's, but I'll tell you what, yeah. these have not been bad to build. I've been very happy with how easy they are, relatively speaking. There's some of, so that's a starter kit. There's another thing to bear in mind about starter kits is they have carefully selected the models and the items that they put in there. The full range is not like that. Okay. Uh, so, for example, um, I have been working on last year some bolt action Soviets. These they're plastic frame warlord bolt action infantry but they're very different from the americans and germans that you get in that starter kit in that each arm and the weapon is separate now as a modeling proposition trying to line that up that is very diff very very different from one where both arms and the weapon are molded together and you just glue it at the shoulder yeah some of these are that way actually there's there's options for it but you can make every single model in that kit never having to align the three part it's the thing with plastic glue is lining up all three parts yeah, it's impossible well, well it's, it's impossible fun. to me some people love that. um and that yeah. brings us to one of the points about the difference between modeling kits and wargaming kits i think i think a lot of war games plastic stuff went down the model kit route of making them increasingly more complicated and have started to roll back from that yeah Although some people love the flexibility that provides, a lot of people don't have the time, effort, or skill. Yeah. Brenda Mann said, if you buy a kit and it says advanced modeling required, it just means it's a bad kit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Kent's paint shack, and Kent does do some really good stuff. Sorry, commission painting four figures, and sometimes I, sometimes I still do. So I do want to mention the people I used for commission painting, Curtis and British Legion, Nick, I, I knew them both meaning they're both on guy and guys that I have talked with for years. Uh, I would, Nick, you know, Nick and I, British, British Legion, and I've been talking for almost as long as I've been on YouTube. So those, you know, they're people I knew and like, and they, they do commissions. So I ask them, Hey, would you be willing to paint? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we figured it out. And I think I probably got a better deal than if I had approached them, I'm guessing blindly, you know, yeah. but yeah. I also didn't mind supporting them because, you know, well, you know, giving them some money is not a problem because, you know, I know them and want them to have their, their, you know, but, and they just do amazing. The thing, the thing with commission painting as well, it, 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 it seems, it seems like a very poor value proposition thinking, okay, so I bought these miniatures. They ended up costing me one pound 25 a miniature or whatever. I then hand it over to a commission painter and he wants 20 quid a model thinking, well, how long do you think, excluding materials and everything else, how long do you think it's going to take him to paint that one model? Translate that into an hourly rate. What does that look like? It takes him two hours to paint your model that he spent, that he charged 20 quid for. He took a top line of, of £10 an hour. He could he could work in a petrol station for that kind of money. <laughs> well, you know, John, it, yep. John, you're right. There is something to be said. And I'm certainly not against that. I I do not begrudge anyone painting. And yeah, you're you're hundred percent right though. Yeah. If you um you do paint them and it's good learning and you do realize again it's not that hard, really. You can do it. Um should we go back to terrain though? Because you got yeah, maybe, maybe we should do that. In fact, if we're, still the, okay. and we're like an hour in. Yeah, I know. So let's talk about um Oh, hold on, man. We got some quick some quick comments come up here. <laughs> no, dude, well, I, I have painted some of those PSCs together. Mm -mm. I'm not doing it again. Email. Yeah. Who wants that? No, it's crazy. I remember getting those, and they're. I remember going like, "What are you serious? Like their little head and the gunner like oh, pfft, Screw that. In ten more years, I won't even be able to see whether the guy's got a head or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I agree with Kent on that. So, so uh, we'll, we'll, let's leave it. We'll leave the commission painting at this comment. I mean, I painted, the, I paid those two guys because it would get done. And guess what? It did. And I've got them now because it would have taken, I'd still be painting those things. So, all right, terrain. And if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to pull up. Let me see if I can do this here. Hold on, everybody. Uh, uh, please hold. As I change, and then I'm going to I need to step away and um, 
take care of some business here. If you want to start kind of talking about terrain. Terrain, okay. yeah, terrain. Terrain is going to, oh, right, I didn't know that this is what you were going to show. This is not. This is obviously not pro planned. Well, I um, I will show the, the the building here in just a minute, but I wanted to show kind of what a, a finished one looks like. Right. Cool. So, um, you're showing one of our bolt action battle boards at the moment, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Um, this is one of our first bolt action games, actually. Uh, what what can I say about this? This is is interesting because what we've got under there is we've got a vinyl mat was one of Johnny B's final maps. So if you look in the kind of foreground at the, the, the floor, that's that's basically a, a PVC grass mat. But the way we approached doing our bolt action boards was to is is to try and cover as much of that as possible, but still having something underneath that would suffice as ground um, that's a bit more sort of multifunction. So like a lot of uh, people have seen, we've got a couple of doormats in there. It's coconut hair, I think, or horse hair. And you just, they're, they're literally just straight from the shop. They're going to cover a, a nice big area. You can do things to make these look better. But the trees are, John bought these. They're like eBay jobs. He's got loads of them there from China. Individually, those trees are actually pretty nasty to look at. <laughs> yeah. No, um, with a bit of clump foliage on the base and as part of a sort of blended board it looks okay the two buildings I think are the Renedra, I think that's the Renedra barn um, and the hedges are just clump foliage blocked on lolly sticks individually almost any of those components apart from the chickens and the pigs in the little pig pen in the, in the middle they're not actually very nice to look at but what works with that board, I think, is is how much of it there is um, and how impactful that will be on the game to give you an overall effect rather than looking at individual pieces of scenery. Um, we actually, that's quite an early board for us, actually. Um, moving away from that a little bit now, but it was a kind of a place to start. This is a side note, as a scenario, this one is, is actually an ambush and it's feeds into one of the things I'm quite feel quite strongly about in war game and is scenarios representing um, historical situations. And when I talked earlier about operational versus tactical versus strategic, you tend to think about an ambush. If I, as a commander, am ambushing your forces, I am entirely in control of this fight. I'm going to win. So the question if you're going to fight an ambush situation is not about who wins, you need to think about the victory conditions as being you need to win by a lot to have considered it a win. It's not about whether the force being ambushed can somehow pull it back. Otherwise, that's a really badly handled ambush of a unit that probably shouldn't be ambushing that, the particular unit that's ambushing. It's more about unless you win by a lot, that doesn't really count as a victory because in this situation, the deck was the deck was stacked. So, yeah, that's, that's this mission. That's that board. What's going on there? And it starts here with the armored car blown up on the corner, and that's kind of this is when the fight begins. It's a little German cog. It's actually an escape from the Falaise pocket, is what we're trying to recreate. But it's only you know the Falaise pocket is still about the ten mile wide opening at its narrowest moment, whereas this is just a platoon <laughs> moving through. But that's what we were trying to recreate. So using the situation to reproduce a particular tactical battle. Um, t you said this at the beginning and I, I missed it and you've told me before. How big is that table? That table is just under four foot by four foot. Okay. Um, most people would say that a six by four table is the way to go. Um, I think whenever you think about table sizes, army sizes, what you want to be thinking about is the space that you have and the game length you want to play. And that it is in the manufacture of the game and the figures in particular company for you to have bigger games with more models. I have yet to play a game bigger and thought that it was better. I thought that the game that was bigger was longer, which isn't necessarily better. In fact, I find after about an hour and a half into a game, I really start to lose my energy. And, and, and in general, I just want the game to end at that point. And more six by four foot games at, at, at commercial scale that they're intended to be played, they're not finished in an hour and a half. So we scale it down. Now, four by four, four by three by three, slightly smaller forces than they recommend. More actually, 750 points on four by four. So 
Well, one thing I came to kind of a realization of, um, in addition to that, that's why my channel name changed to World War, you know, plays World War II, because I realized I'm not going to play any other period. So why, why, why lie? You know, why, you know, well, lies do not become us. Um, but I also realized I too like smaller games. So I had been building, the one reason I had those uh, British Airborne painted up is because there was a command decision, which tends toward bigger battles. Um you know, think convention games or three versus three, four versus five. I was in a 12 player game of command decision at one point. Um, Did you enjoy it? What's that? Did you enjoy a 12 player game of anything? It's fun because you're there with a bunch of people who love history and you're talking and you're, yeah, it's fun because it, it's, it, and the table is amazing. And the guy, I mean, think about it. This was a 12 foot long table. I mean, you can get, it's just amazing to look at. And you're, again, you're talking history and, I'll, so yes, I did like it because, but guess what? It wasn't just the game. It was the lunch. It was the guys talking history. It was the dice rolling. And I, every time I play command decision, I'm out in like, you know, two shots. <laughs> so not really, but anyway, um, but as a solo guy, so anyway, so I was building towards one of the scenarios. I got the troops painted and I put this six by eight table and I got it all terrained out and started playing it. And I was done like by turn three. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, yeah. I need to do smaller battles. And I didn't necessarily make this table six by eight be so I could do large battles necessarily. Um, it, I have the space so that one might as well make a table and I can play board games and miniature games on it. But I definitely realized I like smaller. Yeah. And I, and I, so I started doing these two by two scenarios. Now that's really small, but, yeah. but it's just something to do. And I've got one set up right here. That's why I'm pointing over there. But the three by three, four by four. And that's honestly, that's how I started. My first table was a 42 inch by 42 inch table with a well. I mean, it was kind of a, you know, played inside and then could cover it yeah. up at night. Yeah. I had a grot. You can see them on my channel. I had a lot of fun games that way. So, and they get done. Yeah. Yeah. They get done. That's the thing. So there's a few golden rules and this is, so in my real life, I'm a librarian. I read a lot of books. I work in a school library fairly big school with a fairly big library. And I, I spend a lot of time reading stories to kids, especially short stories you fit, you know, in a single session, whatever, the teenage kids. Um, and what I realized about re having read so many short stories and started to apply some of my gaming was to start to think about how do you make a successful short story that still tells a story? The answer is it's really closely cropped. The, the, there's very little by way of introduction, who these people are, what they're like, da, da, da. it just kind of throws you in at the deep end. It cuts straight to the action. So if you imagine a kind of patrol in Vietnam, you don't spend time with them smoking marijuana in the tent. You start immediately on patrol, maybe somebody nervously fingers for a joint while he's moving around, kind of bringing all of that baggage with it mentally, but never explaining it in the story. But it crops it right down to the action. And, and, that, and applying that to the war games is to thinking about with the scenarios that you have, that you should, you don't need a bigger table where you both spend two turns moving towards the middle. You want to start in the middle. Yeah. If you if you think about how battles or read about how battles actually take place, there's no such thing as a meeting engagement, for one thing. I mean, there's like Rommel's race to the wire. There are instances of, a, of the classic war game meeting engagement. But generally speaking, battles are operational. I am attacking you at this time, at this place, with this many forces. So everybody knows it's happening, and it isn't happening until it's happening. People don't, you know, the German lines and the British lines in the First World War are the points 150 yards apart, and yet they don't spend 4 million rounds of machine gun ammo every day. Right. It's because they don't, they don't, when they're not fighting, they're not fighting. There's a lot of not fighting. So, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that you can have a smaller board and you just bring everything in closer. And that, that does cause you problems if you have a system that really needs the space. And you do still need to follow the kind of core guidance that a rule system usually has around deployment in terms of the distance apart. So you don't want is the game to start and somebody pans a faust your tank on turn one. Because that you shouldn't be probably that close. Yeah. If the game normally has 18 inches apart on a six by four keep that 18 inches apart as you rule you just have less space behind yeah less space to decide but crop the action down to the bit you want to play then you will finish your game in an hour or two yeah yeah we see miller's hey miller's miniatures thanks for popping on it's a new name i haven't recognized before so that's cool um, I am. 
It's a great stuff. <laughs> with uh, English Civil War at the moment, I think was his last thing. Remember? Oh, Miller's. Yeah, yeah. He started a few months ago. Maybe, right. maybe. Well, go check out his channel. I didn't know it was a channel, so I'm making a note here to go subscribe. Um, good point about Game Link, throwing a newcomer. Yep. And, yeah, it's if it's there, you kind of get a, a something to completion, so that's pretty cool. This is fantastic. I don't know 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, amen, brother. Um, Let's see here. Is there another one about? Okay, so just want I want to go back to tabletop generals. They're kind of talking about because I, I I mentioned talking about losing, you know, getting knocked out, but I think that's kind of where this comes from. For the losing side, there should be a chance to win. Oh yeah, definitely. You can do that with points or uh, victory point locations or you know battle kills or whatever. Definitely um, scenario design. I think a lot of the companies do a good job um, creating that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I played actually on that guy that put on the command decision game. He put on an amazing uh, Alamo game, and you know, there's not a lot there to think about as the Mexicans, but there is actually. No, I'm sorry, as the Texans, it was actually pretty fun. I can't remember which side. I think I was a Texan, but you know, shifting your defenses. I mean, you pretty much know the result. It's going to happen, right? Unless the, or as they say, uh, I, I can Isn Isandwana or something. Is that nice? I'm trying to say Isandwana. That's yeah. rocks, Tom. Yeah. So uh, I'm not really sure what they mean, but yeah, battle group. Um, I mean, even if it's clear which side has to lose, you can make winning. Yes, 100%. The yeah. scenario design, game design, all that. So um, so yeah, I would recommend, if, especially if someone's new, and I guess a lot of people here watching the next second aren't necessarily new, but definitely go check out Modeling for Advantage's videos because you do see a couple of people having a very good time on a very small board. Um, and also, I, I've mentioned him a few times, Kitchen Wargamers, fairly very new channel. And he's playing on his kitchen table. And I think it's four by four. It's two sheets of foam stuck to the top of his table every time. I think it's like a little little round, maybe three foot wide circle that he's got a board over. Yeah, I just started watching yep. it because you mentioned it. So, you know, that was my... That should, I, should I say... Terrain. Terrain. Yeah. Yep, keep going. Because <laughs> that was... You did see in that this is the, the kind of the first. If you have a piece of terrain, this this is probably the one of the first kind of things that you're going to build. This is just a piece of expanded expanded polystyrene with a bit of flock on it. It's been used as a modular hill. So this stuff you can make this stuff yourself really really cheap. It's going to get it's going to get you going. The next step that I would say to look at is because you can just cut this out of a out of a box that TV or computer came in, right? Is cheap things from China. These things currently on, on places like Amazon and eBay, you can buy they're, they're fairly poor quality when you get up close. You know, they've been mass produced. It's just flock stuck on some bits of stick. But if you mount them on a base and you put a little bit of clamp foliage on and so forth, you can get, again, they're not individually very nice trees. But when you've got lots and lots of these on a base or in an area, it starts to look quite good. So just similarly these are some ones of the pine trees these come in a bag of 50 for about ten dollars to be fair there's more than 10 on that one four inch base there you do need loads of them but on on bulk they look quite good what um what, what do you stick in those trees to that's what i struggle with a little bit so uh this is this is just mdf and i've just drilled through super glued the back Okay. Yeah. Um, is is how I've done that. It's obviously a little bit, of, a little bit of flock and a little bit of uh, foliage and so forth. And in order to use them in your war games, there's two different schools of thought. One is that these these are where they are and that's where they are. But I'm a big fan of the footprint. So this whole area is wooded. So again, we're just experimenting. We're putting a little bit of flock on this. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not very happy with, with this at the moment. I'm going to go back to this. But the point about this is that you have your trees on them, and if you're playing like 15 mil or something, these are not individual trees. It's an area of woodland. I actually have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about woodland in war games because if there isn't a path through woodland, you ain't getting in and you ain't going through. <laughs> if you look at the roadside, the next time you're driving – and there's woodland at the side of you, you look at what the edge of that wood looks like. It is absolutely thick 
with foliage at the edge. Inside the forest floor may be fairly clear, but at the edge of it, where there's sunlight hitting, it is just completely overgrown with bushes and so forth. You get war games rules that say, you can see, oh, you can see two inches into the wood, you can see three inches into the wood. You look at a wood and ask yourself how many feet you can see into that of a guy who's actively trying to hide. I would go with nil. And how are you going to cross that, get into that? I don't think you can do it. I Maybe do that. Would. I do that all the time when I'm out. My, in fact, my kids, just when I, whenever we go out to the country with the, the in-laws and stuff out where they live, I'm always like looking at stuff and they're like, are you looking at that like it's a board game table? Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah. And that's 100% accurate. I mean, uh, like a line of trees even, like, you know, out here in the, you know, kind of like the bocage or hedgerows in France, we have that out here, but they're basically, we call them tree lines. It's where yeah. farmers have planted trees to block the wind. And yeah. even with those, and those are just trees like, bloop, 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 but then, you know, year, yeah. you can't even see past that. And that's one line of trees. So yeah, yeah you're 100% right about, <clears throat> now they do vary. Some forests have, are very thick and some you could drive a tank yeah. through and some you can't. So yeah, it and I, I, I play Blitzkrieg Commander most of the time where it's called impenetrable. So all you can see is the ones that are on the edge, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it's, and it also makes it easier. <laughs> I don't mind rules being simple, but I do think forests are one of those areas. And you, you, if you look at, if you just look at the edge of, a, of an area of woodland, if there isn't a path going, and just ask yourself, can I just go in there now from here? And so without without tools, no, I can't. Yeah. There's stuff in the way. Or even if I could, I could just walk around it in so much less time. Well, yeah, 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 hundred percent. So, so just some of the ways to get, but in terms of your first bits of war game scenery, though, so it's about those cheap forest which you can do. You really need to think about what scenery is going to do for your table because it's quite easy to create. And that's why I think forests and hills are important. Um, but what you want out of your scenery at the, at the very beginning is to break up the board into lanes to stop you having, I've got my line of weapons over here and you've got your line of weapons over there and anything can shoot anything. You need to stop that because then it just becomes a dice off on turn one and it's about target priority. If you want to encourage movement, you need scenery fundamentally that blocks line of sight primarily. Secondarily, ideally, creates movement lanes as well. The more labyrinthine your battlefield is, the more effective your terrain is. You can have a million walls, hedges, rough ground, None of that terrain is going to have nearly the impact that a single pile of books in the middle of the board would have in terms of affecting what things can shoot at and what they can affect. Yeah. Um, so, no, that's great about line of sight. You know, um, and Flames of War on a couple of their older books and stuff, I don't know where they put that. I, I don't know where I've seen it, but they do a couple of cool things where they show pictures of good board, bad board type of thing. And like mm -hmm. kind of how to lay it out kind of where it's a little bit more natural, right? Because it's really easy just to throw crap on the table and like, there's my trains. Like, well, why is that river? That, I mean, if you put a river in the middle of the table, you're not, now you have like, again, you're lobbing over the river if you can't cross it. So you have to kind of think through like also yeah. places where you can't even game. Like, well, you just made that area where it's ungameable, which is fine. Maybe that's a point, but. It's intended. Yeah. It's but intended. That's one thing I think. I struggle. That's one thing I also struggle with. That's why I like using scenarios that are designed out because people have kind of thought that through a little bit. And I'm not talking about scenarios like in bolt action where it's just this plain board and they say, you have to get this objective and you know, your opponent puts down. I like the ones that show like, like two fat lardies does an amazing job with their chain of command scenarios. You know, they show you cause they've thought it through um, about that. And that's one less thing, you know, obviously you see a thing with me. I want it easy. Um, let's, I want to look at a couple of things about, um, uh, about this. I kind of had this up here for a while. So John's talking about a bag of green cloth pom-poms, which are those that like, look like pom-poms with their little green things. Um, yeah. You can you can lay those down. So if you're, the cool thing about small scales, so um, I've done this uh, with six mil, and it usually works with six mil or smaller, but you get the clump foliage, so it's just that kind of foamy looking stuff, you know, from, and here it's Woodland Scenics for trains. And you can just buy a bag of that and you kind of clump that together and that's your woods. You don't even need, uh, what's it, doodles? You know, you don't even need uh, bark and uh, limbs. And, oh, 
stick well and stuff, yeah, you can just have the clump falling. Yeah, it's just the clump. It's just, you know, because if you're thinking about it, like especially if you're battling at six and when I'm doing, and each stand's a platoon or a company or something, well, you don't, who cares how tall the trees are? You're just, you're kind of representing. So that's another thing you can do. Um, yeah, so that's another way to make woods. And my things were made out of felt. You know, I just went and bought felt at a fabric craft store and cut them out. This one yeah. I painted. Um, and it kind of, the cool thing about doing that, it kind of stiffened it a little bit. So it kind of was a little bit, but yeah. you don't even have to do that, but that didn't take much. Just a little bit of green paint, put a little bit of flock on it. I learned that actually from what would Patton do, which is a channel I miss. But, um, anyway, that's one way of doing it. Use. And so I've got gray felt, blue felt. And, and, th and that's a great way that the original picture you showed from one of my games with the videos, the first, the most important thing with your foot, with your terrain is that the boundaries are clearly defined is that this type of terrain works like this, this type, and, and you can do that with with felt, like you said. Just put put this down. That's rough ground. You, know, you can build towards improvements later, but at least it's clear what each section is, and it's easy for the models to interact with them. And I did six months with polyonics. I had little cloth green squares for fields. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it looks good. So, you know, like those Chinese trees that you bought, and I probably need to clue in and get some of those and um, get the MDF and do some drilling. But you can make those look even better, like just even a little bit of spray or a little bit of glue and flock. You can make those trees kind of tone down their plasticness if that's yeah, important right. to you. Yeah. The winter ones look, that I did looked a lot better because because I was able to deal with that a little bit. We sprayed it from the top, just misted it with white spray, okay. and then pulled on a lot of the white snow flock that we use. And they looked so much better because there was more layers to it. It was more texture. That's cool. So Miller asks, so would you suggest in certain games that if you wanted to access woodland, you would have to roll to see if you can break through to woodland, for instance, having engineers clear a path? 100%. I mean, you know, Flames of War tries to mimic that with a, you know, breakdown or whatever they call it now. So, well, this is about rules design. So I just talked about realism and forests. I am not a fan of overly complicated rule systems. I would in answer to that question, I wouldn't favor a system like that, but that's because I feel it's adding layers of mechanics to a game. I think the reality is that it should be quicker to walk around the woodland and go through it. You're right. And th and that then that makes a channel that you could create a lane of fire or a defensive point. Um, so Miller, how I would approach that is it depends on what you're battling out. So I'm a I'm a historical, so I'm always looking at historical things and how I'm gonna battle it out. I don't I'm not a I have a hard time playing games where I just get the two armies together and build a table and go at it. I need some kind of context and story. But the cool thing about any almost almost any rule set, you could add like a little special scenario rule saying, in this case, to get through those woods, you need engineers to clear a path. You could make something up if you wanted. Um, that's kind of how I play. And all these most other rules are flexible enough. You can do that. And it makes that particular scenario come to life and represent the situation. You're going to do it in every game you play of whatever maybe not but you so, could i can't speak for outside of europe but i can speak for north northern europe certainly on this subject of forest because again i think it's a bit it's a little bit misunderstood and this is a very poor representation of forest now if you've been to the forest <laughs> as an adult you've probably been to a forest that's run by a forestry commission and is forested and that's not what a natural forest looks like at all, or even one in the 1950s look, as in something where they plant the trees and then they cut the trees down 50 years later and they've got their whole thing. Is, and there's there's different types of trees, there's fire breaks and so forth. That's not natural forest in any way. And that's not the kind of forest that you like because that is a forest. The kind of thing you're going to get in a war games table uh, is what you've got is areas of uncultivated land is what you've actually got. So... The areas that can be flattened have been flattened and farmed. And the areas that cannot easily be flattened have been left and trees have grown there. That is actually where you find trees in Northern Europe. And yeah. so the ground is very, very uneven and generally quite steep and a bit stony. And it's all natural, completely uninterfered with by human hands because it's the bit of land what I can't use for growing or farming. Yep. That's that's what's between the fields and so forth. And that's the stuff that all the way around the edges because <laughs> no cultivating it, it's all massively overgrown. I'm not talking about 
um, as I said, a, a forested forest, that's something that's being chopped down and used for timber, that's going to be clearly accessible. But in terms of World War II, have you seen footage of the Americans in the Hurgan Forest? It's crazy. There's they're basically the entire army is trying to move up one road that they have had to build because because it's just not flat at all. Right. You know, it's it's really dense, it's really uneven, and that's a that's a fairly natural forest. But I think it was forested for timber. Well, okay, so yeah, and that's another thing to think about. Um, uh, real quick, Mad Dog, you're right. Even clear straight train. I mean, there's very little straight train in the earth. <laughs> there's dips and dives. That's why I like a rule set that covers, has that element. And even like Flames of War has it when, if you don't move, you are gone to ground, right? Or I don't, oh. I, get, I get the two mixed up, but there's a little bit of an acknowledgement that if you're not moving, you probably can hide somewhere. I mean, man, side notes diversions like crazy like when i watch videos with body cams in Af afghanistan or something like that i rarely see who they're shooting at right you can't see people on a battlefield i mean a guy is quite small even a tank you can hide in some things <laughs> it's like it's crazy to me if i watch tank battles where they're firing across like what are they shooting at now understanding that film is different than real life but anyway Another thing to think about, though, is like the scale that we're playing at. We stick with Flames of War and Bolt Action. You don't have time to clear woods out. You're fighting an action that takes place in 10 minutes or something, you know, yeah. or 30 minutes or 20 minutes. I mean, it's it's a compressed amount of time until you start getting like Blitzkrieg Commander where your turn's maybe 15 minutes long and maybe you're getting a little bit more time. But two hours isn't any time for an engineer to clean out a, a woods. So, yeah, realistically, yeah, you're probably right. We probably shouldn't be going in woods. But... There's something to be said with abstracting. Defend the defending player can be in the woods. He's had time to sort it out. Light infantry or certain unique troops can go anywhere. But I personally look at look at woodland and think that this is essentially impassable to regular troops carrying a normal amount of equipment. Not because it is impassable, but because it's so much more difficult than walking around. And that barbed wire achieves this effect in the First World War. You can cross barbed wire. But you're not going to try and do that if there is a gap in the barbed wire over there. And everybody knows that. So they put gaps in the barbed wire and they land the machine guns up on it. <laughs> it's not that you it's not that you can't cross the barbed wire. It's just it's, ex it's extremely slow. It's extremely effortful. You are under you're in combat. You are not looking to take the path of most resistance, even if it might be the logical one on a on a kind of God level. You're trying to get to where you need to get to. You're going to follow the clear paths. Unfortunately, yeah. in your best interest, but that, that's that's what people that's how people actually behave, I think. Well, you know, that's yeah. I mean, I one thing I struggled with as a as a newbie um, playing miniature games was the concept of ground scale and man scale and shooting range, and I kept wanting to make it like exactly like if my 15 millimeter guy it must be represented it's like that's just not how it works in a, a game because one your range like we were saying like flames of war you're talking about a 400 yard thing which is tiny 400 that's no distance at all but um so you kind of that's important to kind of get that you kind of have to abstract some things out and like we're talking about with woods and stuff it's an you're having to i mean if you wanted to play it realistically it's going to be a pretty boring game because <laughs> yeah Yes, which is why I'm saying I favor impassable, not because I think that's more accurate, but because it's, I think it's better mechanisms to reproduce the difficulty. Yeah. Is my thing. Um, yeah, yeah you, you're absolutely right there. Yeah. And that's accurate there. I'm going to look through some of the comments here real quick and see if there's something else. Um, uh, uh, see, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, here's some, another idea actually going to use some plastic card sheets for that cut into more i think he's talking about wood still so hey we don't call call us late call us early just call us right so this is a this is a uh, board war gamer hex to hex he's been doing some we've been kind of chatting back and forth about board uh, board games war games so i'm going to do a whole another time on you know board war games and stuff but right now we're talking about miniatures um they can't uh, appreciate that um so anything else you kind of want to mention about um, – I should just keep this one up here because it makes me feel good about what we're doing. Um, anything else about terrain you want to talk about? I mean – Oh, gosh, we're still only on terrain. Um, to, to just think to me, 
when you make your terrain and you set up your boards, think hard about well, not hard, hard, but think about what actual impact it has on the game. Is there's a real? It's possible to create a lovely looking board with loads of items on it. They don't really do anything. Then the most important thing is that you have got some line of sight blocking elements on the board, which are going to divide the battlefield up into sections, not artificial ones like sticking a big ball down the middle of it, but things that just force people to manoeuvre to shoot at what they want to shoot, even just a little bit. And on a very simple level, just a big tower block in the middle of the board is going to do, if you've got nothing else, pile some books up in the middle of the table and let that do half that work for you. Right. Exactly. So real quick, I just real uh, pre-show. So Kaiser and I got together like 30 minutes before and just to make sure everything was working. But uh, I went to his channel to find some stuff and I found this cool mini, uh, mini cool uh, video that he just put up. And let me share my screen here. And it's kind of hard because you see mainly him in his library like you've been seeing him. But if you take a look down here in this corner, it's a whole video on making a gaming board war games table build paint texture and flocking table tape ring just came out 13 minutes long uh came out on december 30th so i haven't watched even watched yet i didn't even i missed that one when it came out but he goes through the whole thing about building that table any comments on this uh kaiser um it was so the reason for doing it was uh, a bit like a bit like a lot of the viewers are going to be in that situation is i've got lots of bits of terrain that i've built over the years or bought and it, none of it quite fits together so i thought i'd start from not start from scratch but but if i make my own board and i flock it a certain way i will then go back to all of my terrain and apply the same flock to everything so that the forests and the hills and everything it's especially hills don't just look like strange green blobs on a different colored background i really don't like the way that things like hills and forests sort of erupt from a board so I thought let's and it was we were in lockdown here so i got the bits delivered screwed it together and started building a board this video is not like 100 percent best way to make your own war games table it's just my vlog of what i did and you can learn from some of the mistakes that i made though for example it did bow a little bit because i battened it around the edges i assumed it wouldn't but actually that wasn't quite enough from one end to the other as probably about an inch so it, it does rock slightly. It's not it's not a problem um, for me to use it, but I think if I was doing it again, I would have battened it underneath and particularly across the middle. Okay. I do want to point out to everybody that uh, on my suggested videos next to it, check this out, Bob Ross. So the Restless Kaiser is on the same level as Bob Ross. Fact. And I do paint with a four-inch brush. That, look at that, eh? Pro. Yeah, let's look at that. Let's look, look at this. Look, look at that. Happy Happy floor. It's a happy floor right there. Is that um is that chocolate there? Would you melt some um like Hershey's chocolate or something there? Because that's what Hershey's chocolate's good for is putting on the table. We don't get Hershey's in Britain. We obviously we have food standards here. <laughs> no, Amen, bro. Uh, that's just acrylic paint and um, brown acrylic paint with a bit of black. But from an artist acrylic paint, cheap artist acrylic paint, not miniature paint. It's still fun. Yep. Oh well that okay so yeah. let's let's convert over to paints and brushes real quick and let me just tell everybody so there's some amazing paints at Vallejo Army Painter uh, Mig whatever you can use it for whatever you want but don't use that for your uh, terrain please just go buy some cheap oh. acrylic big old tub of it at our hardware stores and I'm sure it's the same in England if someone goes in to get paint mixed and it doesn't come out right they are like, they'll sell them for like a dollar because, you know, they have this little can of brown or tan or whatever that they, they're not going to, they can't sell it because it's this odd color. So, I mean, they can't sell it to paint a room because it's not enough, but they like, well, here, we want to sell it. So they sell it for $2. Man, you got yourself some paint to painted like he was doing. Here in the paint shops, they sell little pots of, of, of house paint as tester pots for their range. So you can get, yeah. you can get a dark brown and it's like, it's like, I don't know, your equivalent of about $2. But it's it's about five, you know, it's about two hundred fifty mil of paint. It's about fifteen twenty bottles of Vallejo paint equivalent for yeah. a fraction of price. If you just didn't, I'd use it for my basing, painting my bases, um, and and my terrain and so forth. Yeah, don't use it on your miniatures. The pigment is much much larger <laughs> on your miniatures, um, but but on terrain and stuff, it's fine. Yeah. Um... Uh, if someone was playing like this, Millers, I'd question who I was playing with there. Um, yeah, mate. Uh, 
so craft paint. So let me just start with that real quick. So, um, you know, there, so here we got apple barrel and I don't know, you know, miss Joanne's favorite paint to paint, you know, a kitty cat ceramic thing or whatever. Right. That paint is also good for painting, um, you know, like, like these little Sarissa buildings that I have. So this was painted with craft paint for the most part. Um, Sarissa once came painted. No, no. Foreground, foreground comes painted. I am a huge fan of Sarissa. And let me tell you why, because the foregrounds are beautiful. I mean, they're amazing, but they are mm, fiddly. And we've all know my, my stance on modeling. They look amazing. The Sarissas go together. I have had very little, very little problems with them and they paint up fantastic. I think that looks great. I mean, I'm not bragging on my own painting. I'm just saying it painted up very easy and it looks pretty good. Um, but the craft paint can be good for that because you're just kind of, you still water it down a little bit, but even I, I, you can even paint some minis with some of those smaller bottles of craft paint. If you water it down, you can paint boots. You can even paint some of the, I mean, look, we're talking about browns, greens, and tans. So you don't have to get crazy. If you can only afford a craft paint figure, you can do it and your models can look decent. Um, um dun, 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 dun. yeah, ASL boards are good. I have done that. So if you have any board games, check out their terrain on their maps on the board games and use those as kind of guides about where to lay down forests and buildings. Cause like he says, they've thought those out. They haven't just like willy nilly put them around. They put them down to block line of sight and do all that stuff. I, I don't know what that's in reference to, but it sounds ominous. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is an interesting point that uh, Jen's just brought up there. It's had some of them might be less to it. One of the problems with um, if you're playing a pick up and play war game, so everything I just said to you about terrain and sticking something in the middle is very much about a pick up and play game. R really, for some of us who want to move towards much more scenario driven games, that are much more credible. One of the things about it, where people fight battles is they're not full of terrain. You know, nobody fights in a swamp. Nobody fights through a forest. You know, I'm not saying it never, never happens. So predominantly, battles take place in the summer in on the plains. <laughs> That's where battles happen because both sides are invested in being able to bring their forces, deploy them adequately, control them adequately, and be able to either exploit or retreat adequately without all of these things getting in the way. Indeed, in defensive scenarios situations people have usually cleared the space in front of them so that when you start attacking there isn't a tree line you can hide in they chop them down so they could shoot you on the way in yeah so I, actually terrain's a bit a bit funny in, in some ways in terms of pitch battles certainly in prepared positions which is the reality of how most battles take place i guess but they do make the games much more interesting much more interesting i'm going to put this up here but just because it's a private joke. I don't know. Way to go, my dog. I think I was talking about the painting. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, how about, uh, do you have a favorite paint that you like using? Um, so like everybody, you go through, you go through phases. Um, one of the big things that most people buy paint based upon availability, don't they? So for a lot of people that is going to be Games Workshop's paints. All I would say about Games Workshop's paints is I would say I do use them, but I use them less and less over time because the things that are good about Games Workshop paints are actually bad habits to get into. So you can flip open the lid of a Games Workshop paint and you can take paint straight from the pot and you can just use it. And you shouldn't be doing that. You should be thinning that paint before you put it on anything. But you can use it straight from the pot. I increasingly use, and I do still tend to use their stuff like their yellows and their reds where some of the other companies really struggle to get those vibrant colors that perhaps that as war gamers, these colors don't really exist in natural fabrics. Nothing is that bright. Cause it'd be a bit like, Argh! but we want that, you know? So um, we paint our, I don't know, we paint the, the epaulets and the, and the shoulder boards on Soviet infantry in a, on a 10 mil figure. You can see it from three foot away. So you're not going to see the red epaulets on that Soviet infantryman from the other side of there, but we've painted it a little strike of a bright, bright of quite a bright red. So Games Workshop, yeah, their paints, they do work, which is one of the great things about them. You know, every paint in their range is going to, it's going to work from the pot reasonably well to have shake it. Increasingly, because I'm doing a lot more of the, mod, the historical stuff, I use Vallejo paints. 
they're dropper bottles. So that's a bit more involved, isn't it? There's no way of using this paint without pouring it out. So if you're a total newbie at this, you're looking at that and thinking, well, what do I do? Do I unscrew the cap and dip the brush in or whatever? You do need to decant the paint. But I have yet to get to the end of a Vallejo paint bottle. And yet they have the same liquid contents of Games Workshop. And I have thrown that because the Games Workshop stuff just dries out because of the nature of its bottle. Whereas, you know, it's, it's so open and it all clags up around it or whatever. Um, but because you need to decant from Vallejo, yeah, okay, you need yourself. Most people these days would have a wet palette, but frankly, a magazine cover, any kind of glossy paper will get you started. That's fine. Um, and you can just mix a little bit of water in with it there. But why I like Vallejo is because they have such a wide range of browns and greens. It's like, well, my Russian helmets need to look different from my U.S. Army helmets, but pretty much they're all the same, aren't they? My Russian winter green uniform, how is that different from my U.S. Marines? So why I used the, you know, a, a olive drab and then I gave it a light, a khaki dry brush. Yeah. No, you just did that for your Russians. <laughs> and you're doing that for your early war Germans. And, well, they've got the variation in the color range. And as an army painter, oh, I'm going to bring it up. Because if I have a painting tip, this, and we all know it. And none of this is not as exciting as you might think. This uh, is the painting tip. Have you got one of these, Todd? I've tried. I never consistently use it, but it's a great idea. So share it. This is the painter's log. I paint 12 German infantry today, 20 German infantry today. I paint the, boot, the boots with Luftwaffe Camo Green 897 or whatever. Two years from now, I'm not going to remember that. So I wrote the blessed thing down so when I paint the next model, it's going to look pretty much the same. A lot of people think they should do this, and a lot of people don't do it. I can tell you that once you started, if you've ever gone back to a project like that, and, and you don't know exactly what you used. It's so irritating trying to re -re recreate, particularly actually more less with infantry. I find because you tend to know because you paint, if you paint infantry, you probably painted a lot of them. But if you painted, I don't know, five Soviet tanks for some force that you used briefly, you probably didn't paint many, and you don't quite remember which shades you used to dry brush and yeah. whether pigment you used because there were a lot of options there, and it was only a sort of last step. Then when you do it, or oh, did I give it a black wash or a brown wash? Write the blessed thing down in your book. Do it. Do it. And it doesn't need to be complicated like you just saw there. The big thing was just uh, some of them a lot more complicated. So that's like a 28 mil German infantryman because there's a lot of potential possible. But look, that's all I wrote for my Soviet World War II. Just says I, I did this and I did this and I did that. But I've written whose paint I used. And with the Vallejo, I've written the numbers down. Because actually, sometimes the names change a little bit. Refractive green is reflective green or mm -hmm. vice versa. And there's two bottles called Russian Uniform. And there's green gray and there's gray green. And they're radically different colors. Yep. You can easily write that down. So I always write the numbers down. That's fantastic. Uh, my... Um... <clears throat> My painter's journal is The Colors of War by uh, Flames of War. That's fantastic. It's fun. It, you know, for, for a beginner, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. It really is. You know, it's not going to tell you how to paint Panzalaire in Normandy 1944 in P.Dot Camouflage, specific to it, but it is going to tell you how to paint a German vehicle that looks like a German vehicle. Right. So we've got a lot of votes for Vallejo. You got Kent agreeing with you on the painter's log, and I'm sure him being a professional painter, it's super valuable. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I do like, uh, so just real quick, Mad Dog was referring to apparently Amazon Warrior Queen herself, Flora Jantz, talking about the floor, blah, blah, blah. He's getting deep here, Mad Dog. He's getting deep. That's uh, good stuff, though. We like, appreciate the history. John Longshore says, German uniform color, six drops of essence of terror, three drops of sinister sauce. Uh, when the stirring's done, I lick the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> I I have heard a little bit about AK, um, but I don't know anything about him. I'm again, I'm the I like Vallejo. I've liked it since I got it in the beginning. So I've and I've tried to go try other paints, but painting is not something I really honestly care about getting really great at. So I'm like, what Vallejo works. And now I have the colors of war book, I'm good. But I, I want to get better at other things, like I guess like making videos and talking. <laughs> That's what I want to get better at and you know, playing more games. But um trying these new lines like AK. Um 
and others are good. So, yeah, I think with with paint and in terms of that, you you need to experiment at your own pace. I think, and it really depends the look that you're going for. I think you can go further and you can go further and you can go further. But for me, uh, you know, uh, what was important was to get a base from which I was comfortable. And that was about, if I'm going to use a primary color, for example, a blue, a red, a yellow, like I talked about, I, I probably use a Games Workshop one because I know it will work quite well. And, I'm, and the Vallejo is more of the experiment for me. And then once I'm familiar with that, and I hear good things about certain P3 paints, and I might slowly introduce them, but the this stuff is really dangerous. And actually, I'm not that good a painter. And so my painting is quite fragile. I kind of, you know, I need it to work, really. And I need it to, I need what I intend to happen. As in, I know that if I did this with these Vallejo paints, that, I, that it would look okay. But if I try it with these P3 paints, they might not look right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Am, I, am I willing to do that yet? And at some point you are, but I think you have to take those things at your own pace. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, I mean, people are using oils too. You go look, go look at James Wapple, Wapalicious, the guy, his oil painting is incredible. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. I, I mean, if you want to go with the pro painting, there's, there's actually so much being learned now from the scale modelers, aren't there? Because they, they spend two years on one tank, whereas war gamers, yeah, I've got to paint the battalion in a week. <laughs> Yeah. And this is a huge thing about uniforms. I mean, we, we, we all talk about it a ton of times, but if there are any newbies watching, Hey, I mean, no field gray. I mean, there's a blog out there called 50, 50 shades of field grail. And that's accurate. I mean, look at it. So you don't have to get too, I mean, do some research, get as close as you can. But I mean, if someone starts complaining about your, your green gray color, consider your, consider your uh, opponent. <laughs> um, to, to my answer to that one of German field gray is I use the Vallejo bottle called German field gray. It's probably not perfectly accurate, but neither are any of the other options. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Let's just kind of go through the comments here. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, any time spent outside doing anything and that's their toast. Um, I need to, I need to bring, I need to use this in a video at some point, actually, you know, this business is talking about fighting, in Normandy, the idea of canvas. So troops have got a lot of canvas equipment and we often paint it as bleach rather than the original color. I actually have a canvas rucksack, which is five years old. And I'm a fat guy who walks to a train station once a day, doesn't spend a lot of time in the sun with a rucksack. And that bag has got no color on the outside of it. You know, because it's canvas, you can see the original dark yeah. green area and how washed out it is on the outside. And it's said nothing more than just comes to and from work. You know, it's got my sandwiches in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, cheap one so it's not been made with a you know a dye that will last and it's well, quite maybe. a contrast between how much is washed out yeah i mean they were and they were especially the germans they were running out of crap man they're just dying it however they could and <laughs> so at the end so, i think towards the end they were issuing the troops with uh unpainted aluminium mess tins you're like wow that's gonna catch the lights on that isn't it <laughs> um yeah, there's, you know, contrast paints. We could go on about paints forever. Um, people have had some good, I've seen some really good looking World War II imagery and other things, horses painted with contrast paints. I just think, I, I think I bought one bottle just to try it, a pot. Sorry. Yeah. If, if we're talking about this from the perspective of beginning, because the painting thing is endless. You know, there's there's never been a model painted that couldn't have been improved you know I, I think that that's that's the problem with the hobby and one of the things to realize as a hobbyist is to decide upon a point at which you are happy with it or you are satisfied with it at least or you are going to stop those are, and those are slightly different things aren't they? this is the point where i'm going to stop but if you want a place to begin you mentioned the colors of war um as a, as a painter paint the basic colors and then give it a wash of either Oh, what's the army painter one called? The army painter, the probably the strong tone, maybe water down a bit, experiment, or games workshops, Agrath Earth, Agrath Earth Shade, and you will be 50% done compared to a fairly professional job. It's not a brilliant painting standard, but it is <coughs> certainly better than you would have expected it to be by just painting the flat colours and applying that single brown wash to the whole thing. That is how 90% of my figures are done. And then I apply highlights when I can be bothered and they look okay. So yeah, um, I would agree. Uh, some sort of shader and 
uh, and then what water down your paints. That's that's. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the a no brainer. And again, you can get better, and you can even buy products that water it down and stuff. But just a little bit of drop of water that because when I first painted, I didn't do that. And I put on like, dang, why does it look so globby? And it's like, oh, I see. You have to kind of thin it out. Um, so anyway, just so everyone knows, if you're not familiar with it, this is what we've kind of talking about. Um, and it's just for 15 mil. It's basically got paint schemes. The standard that they recommend you paint in your 15 mil infantry in that involves you painting three color camouflage uniforms, which I, I do not do in 15 mil. And yeah. Right. That's not in a hundred percent true. That's mostly true. Um, so that will do you for a, until you're pretty serious as a painter. That'll do you for even fifty-four mil figures if you wanted to. Yeah, and paint in those schemes, and they've got the Vallejo color numbers in the latest edition. Yep, that's I was what so we're... glad. I their little run with their little bullets was like the worst thing that ever happened. That's the worst thing. So I'm so happy they went back to Vallejo and stuff, and yeah. and um, and you can find it pretty easily. So we talked about the painting process um, and we talked about again kind of about setting your expectations i think um uh, and the painting log what i think the other thing is temporarily escaping my mind is to talk about brushes oh yeah brushes and, and stuff if you are a beginner painter the solution to your problem is not to buy better equipment that is not the answer if you're not happy with the work you've done um in, brushes a, a better brush is only better in the hands of a better painter. The overwhelming majority of brushes that I use are from the, the craft shop, but regard your brushes as they're not capital items. They get worn out. They get worn down. If it isn't forming a tip, when you, when you rub it, when you twist and rub, if it doesn't form a tip, it is done. Get another one. And you trash a lot of brushes at the beginning while you're learning what you're doing by really cheap ones. Only when you reach a fairly good standard are you going to get any value out of spending 25, 30 quid on some kind of Winds of Newton sable. It's not going to make it's not going to make the difference. What's going to make the difference in the quality of your work is that you paint neatly and that you paint neatly. That's the thing that's going to make the difference. The more oh. you do, the neater you get. Well, okay, let's look at this. This is Kent. He's a very good painter and he's a professional. And look at him. Yeah, I think that's huge. But you presumably you, you chuck them away often, right? Yeah. Throw them away yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Kent says because yeah, I think some guys you're able if you're there's some things you can do to take care of them that you know it just, it's not too much to help them last a little bit longer. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of chitty chat going on over here. Um, someone asked about people people being put off, but I haven't heard of that too much. I I have heard of it, and I have you know. But I think the majority of people don't. And that's why I like our communities that I see on Facebook. That's where I spend most of my time, Facebook and on YouTube. Most people are very kind. And I rarely have seen a job that is so crap. I'm like, oh, boy, that's embarrassing. Rarely have I seen that. I mean, it's usually it looks fine, especially at smaller scales. So and, if and someone did, they need to be, you know. As like, hobby. When you're, if you're out in the social community and you see somebody makes that post, my first attempt at painting World War Two Italians or whatever, try and be as positive as you can about that. It's clearly it's not going to be good. The internet is full of pro painted stuff, of course it is. But you know, if you're a player, more than anything else, you want the other guy to paint his army, even if it's one eye looking at you and one eye looking for you. You know, you still want them to paint their models by which they'll get better. Yeah. So Kent says he uses older brushes for, you know, that would like, you know, dry brushing and probably terrain or something. You know, there's, you can use those old brushes for uh, years. Um, I have three good brushes, got a series seven and zero, one and two and do about 90% of real, real painting with it. And then a real the cheapies that I do everything else with. Yeah, I did that too. Just bought a cheap bag of whatever to dry brush and paint and do all that stuff. So that's a good thing about brushes. Um, I think we've covered everything there that would someone getting started. Um, we've been going almost two hours, so let's kind of wrap up here soon. Let's talk about, and I appreciate your time. I know it's getting late there for you, um, but it's a it's a it's a Friday after all, right? And it's probably normally you stay up real late partying with all your war gamer buddies. If we weren't all locked in our homes, um, uh, we're in like uh, the, the great restrictions over here. We're not allowed to like you know leave the house, do anything. Like, um, yeah, 
Yeah. So let, let's talk about, you talked about this on your 2021 resolutions. I don't want to take any um, uh, steam out of that video, but people, I go watch it. It's a fun video. He's, what do you got? Like five people on there kind of giving their ideas, but kind of what, exactly. you know, what's your, what's your kind of thinking for 2021? What do you want to see done? Um, so this is more reflections as a, as, a, as a YouTuber, but potentially useful. One of the guys on there um, talks about Trello, which is project management software. Trello, or, uh, yeah. Browser-based, yeah. Um, and, and as, the, as the manager of my own department, I don't use stuff like that. I have a loud mouth and a head to remember things and people to ask to do things. So they need to keep track of what, what's happening, right? Yep. But um, in terms of the channel, one of the things that I come to realize is hobby, because I do a lot of the painting for our channel and a lot of the hobby in. Mm. It's, at least my channel with my friends contributing. You know, and I'm not complaining about that, but I need to get more coherent in the things that I paint and I build and I play. So I'm thinking one of the big things for this year is to start being uh, more coordinated. So painting to a list rather than painting what came in the box which is how I've tended to do things in the past. And what it means is now, because of the number of systems we play, I have got literally hundreds of models that are never going to see the light of day. Because um, often what comes in the box isn't necessarily usable. I don't know. Maybe there's 30 guys in the box, but you can only use them in a group of up to 28 or things like that. I just like to paint what's in the box and then move on to the next thing and end up with leftovers in every army. So I think I probably am going to use some kind of system. I might use Trello or something. I might just work out the list. But to help me plan better for videos is to say, okay, so we're going to be doing – we want to get show, start showing the British in the, the kind of market garden, guards armoured. We decided we wanted to do that, or Irish guards or whatever it is. So let's work out the list, then let's build the models, then let's paint the models, and then, we're, and then at the end of that, that gets – then we make the video. Because there's huge lead times on the things that we do because we play so many different games and we try to bring something new to the table each time. Often that's just that there's one new unit here uh, on one of the sides. Some of them, so I thought we're gonna gonna do a look at the workflow from that perspective, really, being a bit more coordinated. Because one of the things I don't and I'm so, I think I'm different to a lot of other war gamers. A lot of people play, they're very much in the lane, you know, they, they play Warhammer or they play Black Powder or, you know, they play whatever they play. And that's their main game. And then they dabble. They play a bit of music, magic, or a bit of D&D. &D, they maybe play another system with the same miniatures. Uh, and that for a lot of people, therefore, they quite like out-of-game time associated with the games. Magic players love to build decks. Warhammer players love to build army lists. Um, people like pre-game work for the game because it's about it's a part of the game that you can do without needing to be in the club. I hate all of that stuff because I just don't have the time. I hate building lists. I hate anything that's like pre-game work for me is quite irritating. I don't um, especially list building. I really prefer games and said, you get this, I get this, let's roll some dice. That's the kind of game that I like to play. So by by building into the kind of process, the beginning of the painting process rather than at the end of it, start by working out the army list and then do the production of the models is hopefully going to improve that, that a bit rather than, you know, building the list being an important part in the last stage, holding up and making it a video. Cool. That's good stuff. It's a big, that's a big thing for me. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I I typed it just typed it into the comments. Hey, but we got a lot of people chatting here, and I really appreciate all this back and forth we've had. It's awesome. Um, had some more comments about brushes and painting stugs like late war, war or like like uh, World War One ships. But hey, I'm curious, kind of what your all your plans are for the 2021. Like, what's your big thing you want to work on? Um, I do want to say this about Kent, who again is a professional painter who's very good. Um, is people who encouraged him that made me want to paint better and we should always see the best in people's paintings. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Yep. Um, I mean, it's hard enough to get in this hobby cause it's pretty, um, Oh, I see. I posted it twice. Um, it's, you know, it's hard enough to get started in the hobby cause it's so different than many of us are used to. So, um, yeah, here's what, here's, here's a plan. Paint more dude bros, roll more sixes. More he wants to paint more doofers. No, no doubt about it. 
my favorite saying build and paint say, everything it's what's interesting on our video J johnny b's favorite word is do for it's one of these like catch all words if you've not watched our stuff say no just pass me the do for did you do the do for you got the do for i love the do for comments that we get saying i'm sorry i'm from australia or whatever what is a do for <laughs> you get that kind of comment uh so it's delightful when we do it and so it isn't anything it's a word that john to mean it's a universal word oh yeah, that's awesome it's a great word got some good plans coming here look at this watching your video you got it so i um so real quick back to starter set so i actually i found a hit the beach box set for five dollars at my local game store because they were uh, getting, getting rid of stuff out of their warehouse five dollars <laughs> so i bought it and uh, I opened it up, and I got to tell you, I'm a little, that box set's interesting. Um, I've been kind of coveting that thing for a long time, and I'm just a little surprised that the minis are that softer plastic. I was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And they didn't come with any of that cardboard terrain or tokens. The new Hit the Beach set. Yeah. I'm like. Not the old open fire set. No. The I'm like, how, how do you not include that cardboard terrain and those tokens? You have to have those tokens to play Flames of War. Not the the cardboard train, I guess. No, I guess you don't need it. But yeah. it's so cool. Now, I know I think their little starter sets come with the terrain and tokens. Yeah, they do, yeah. Why would you not put that? I can't imagine it costs that much. I don't often like to complain about game companies. You run your company how you want. But I'm just like, what? I, I, I agree. And actually, on the Team Yankee one, they've learned from that. And they may fix it on the Hit the Beach. Because in the Team Yankee one, they printed those tokens on the inside of the box lid. Yes, yeah, fantastic. I mean, for crying not, I mean, that's not great, but they are there. It's a start. For crying out loud, Bolt, Bolt Action puts a, a, a ruler on their cardboard thing. Like, who needs a cardboard ruler? But it's cool. If you do, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's perhaps the last thing to, to mention, just as, as, as when we're talking about starting games, is the other stuff, isn't it? It's the, it's the, it's the tape measures. It's the rulers. It's the dice and so forth. Uh, just to sort of in terms of completeness and i don't know whether you have stuff like this but this is the kind of thing that i use i have one of these for most of my systems this so just drawer my game system one of these stackables and it's got the the relevant tokens yeah so my bolt action pin markers rulers activation dice this box, if I'm playing ball action, I need. I've got another one with my flames of war tokens in, load of dice, etc. And the yeah, I've got that drawer of that stuff too. In fact, just yesterday, I was at the um, craft store with my son because he was having to pick up some stuff for his art class, and I picked up this great thing for board war games. So there's always that little crap to buy that you um, do or do not need, but you really do need for some some things um the basics so let's look at some of the other stuff we got uh, flames of war here plants okay i get that one already build and paint everything impossible john johnny b's gonna do all the doofers um yes. picked up a pack of vikings from victrix and didn't know where i wanted to start but after looking at the raven feast rules have planned to build a force for that and see how it goes that's awesome um enjoy your time we definitely hey thanks for coming on tabletop if you're leaving that's great um John's going to get back to painting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Gun barrel. You and I agree on something. I can't believe it. Uh, yep. Okay. Look nice. What here? I think I'm going to skip something here. Wait, did I, wait, wait. Oh, wait, man, you guys got, you're cranking it out here. I choose one thing every year that I want to paint better than like skin or painting white. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, this is a guy that's trying to perfect his uh, craft, which is awesome. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, this new uh, we'll get some newbie battle reports of load. That's right. We've been trying to get many warm up. So many warm up uh, is with us on Rocky's war room chat. And he was a scale modeler or is a scale modeler. And he's kind of converted to minis games. And it's been fun watching him get all like, there's so many rule sets out here. <laughs> I mean, it's, you just keep wanting to get more rule sets. And that's and a struggle as a newbie. It's preventing him from finishing painting the Star Trek models that he'd done. You know, I'm, I'm actually pretty disappointed with mini warm up there. Whoa. As, Oh, dang. I'll tell you, hey everybody, I do want to point out Mini Warmut. The because he's I, he's got kind of an artistic mind and he's a scale modeler, but he is awesome at creating terrain out of whatever crap he finds around the house. And it's especially cool because he's he's doing it's 
he's doing post-apocalyptic gaming. That's kind of his preferred um, genre. So he can make, he's making some really cool stuff. So right. go check out his channel just to see like, I mean, he's always like, well, you know, but he's very good at it. And he's painting is good because he, again, he has that scale modeler thought and touch. So his, his finished product is really good. I'm always impressed with what he's able to do. Um, <laughs> yep. So you got to find some people to play stuff when, you know, once we, especially once we get out of some of the stuff we're all in. Um, let's see. I'm just going to kind of go through these uh, Saxons. Uh, oh, wait, what's this? One good video for starters. Just get them started in DIY stuff for the table is to make a ruler with a stick and paint the links. Yeah. Well, a lot of rule sets do that because they kind of have set. You don't need two yeah. inches. You just need six, 12 and 18 or whatever. Yeah. So that's uh, that does help. Makes it faster. You know, um, what do we got here? I'll talk about my 21, 20 plans here in just a minute. Um, Cause it's pretty, I'm not going to show you my sock drawer. Well, that's kind of what I did. So that's what you get. Simple as see. Um, let me see what else. Uh, won't buy any Battlefront minis now that they've gone to the horrible soft plastic. I don't know. Is that change? I thought they kind of changed it to a little bit better plastic. Did they not? I thought they kind of improved it. Yeah, well, <laughs> Battlefront plastic is a, is a, is a, but soft plastic is no longer their preferred medium, but I'm not sure the new medium is better. Oh, great. And then we have that. Okay, so I wouldn't be blushing though. This though. Oh yeah. Have you got you got one of these? Yeah. The most useful sort of ten dollars you can spend in your life as a war gamer is one of these. The laser line. This is the answer to all of your line of sight problems. Um, they're a bit difficult to use because they're not they're not point a dot on. They put the line on the table. But if you stick this on the head of the model. It will draw the line across the table. There is no space for argument over line of sight. Either that line, of, that, either that line is going to that model or it isn't. And it's not just about people who are difficult or funny about it. It's often quite hard to sort of get your eye, down, eye level down in the middle of the table and see. You get yourself one of these. It's a really, really useful tool. Uh, it's Army Painter Target Lock. I think Warlord Games do their own branded one, but it's basically the same product. Yeah, the most useful wargaming tool I have. That's really cool. So I learned something just now, everybody. So what this is really for, you can't really figure out. It's, it makes a straight line, a straight laser line on your hand or, you know, whatever. So it makes that straight line. So you kind of stand above it and it's like instead of pulling a string or something, but I like that idea that uh, Kaiser just shared where you kind of get down on the table, get it down the table and push it at the head. So you can see that's really awesome. So these are pretty cool. Um, I'm really glad I have one. Um, another cool thing I've seen people have, but these are big and clunky, are those periscopes that are opposite periscope. Yeah. That, that's a fun, it's a fun way to see the table. I think if you're at War Games demonstration, you know, a convention and you're getting dressed up, then that's the way to go. But if you're just playing on your kitchen table or in a war games club, you can carry one of these things around. Um, just uh, send the commission check to Kaiser. He, he needs the funds for, you know, models and paints and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so. Uh, not um, pointer, mini Walmart. It's not a pointer. No, no, no. Loads of people that it's called laser target lock a laser pointer is just going to put a dot and they're not that useful actually they just look like butt plugs and are a handy thing to maybe have in your dice box but this actually puts a line on yeah target lock laser line okay so um so my my the things i'm thinking about for uh, 2021 is um i want to do some french early war with uh probably i mean it won't be in person but uh with uh Somehow figured out with uh, one of our local guys here, McMurray, who I was talking about. So to do the Jimblo, Gimblo Gap um, game out of Chain of Command scenarios. Oh. I don't know if it'll be Chain of Command or Bolt Action or bigger battles, but so I want to do some paint up some French earlier. Well, that'd be the new stuff I'd be buying. So I have to, I get that fun adventure of like, hey, what do I want to get? The cool thing is with Chain of Command, they got lists of the scenario and you can kind of limit yourself to what they've got there. So it's just a matter of, you know, choosing the manufacturer. Um, I want to finish building 15 mil then, or are you going to do that in 28? Oh, that'll be 15. I'm, I'm, I am trying to do 15s as much as possible. Now this bolt action set that was sent to me was sent to me and by the local, uh, the U S warlord guy to, because I say, hey, I'm doing the series, you know, you're one of my sets. 
can you help me out? And he definitely helped me out. So, but I, I owe it to them to get, you know, do some videos and building out and stuff, but we'll see how it goes. If I do any more 28 than that starter set, but no, the French early war will be 15. Um, but I want to finish that starter set. So that'll know how slow I am. Uh, I have some other stuff that I bought off some people that were already built and I just need to finish kind of painting some of those. I don't have a goal on how many of those. And then just, I want to do more like interviews like this book. I want to, I want to do some book video, comic book reviews, like talk about world war two stuff. And then if I can maybe play a game, that's kind of like, if I read a early war French book, you know, or play a game in it as well as talk about, you know, Hey, I read this book. It's a good book by Alistair Horn, you know, and, and by the way, I read about this battle here on page 78 and let's play a bolt action game of it or something. So, right. Right. So yeah, that's my plans. I'm, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut when you're talking about early war French because there's a whole rabbit hole to go down there about war gaming, which is, we, it's late, isn't it? Yeah, we can talk about it when we get off. So, hey, we've been on here a long time. Um, let me see if there's anything else. A link to Mini Warmuch channel. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Mini Warmut, can you post that on there? I'm going to just ask you to do that for yourself. I, I don't think there's any restrictions. You can post it in my comments, I believe. I don't think I've restricted that. Um, and if not, I will can put it in the comments or something. But uh, And I think you can't, well, you can't do it on the live portion. Sorry. Um, if it's a comment in the regular videos, you can click on them and go to their channel. Uh, let's see here. North Hag, I need to teach my cats to play. <laughs> they appreciate my skills. Okay. So anyway, more joking around. We're not, we're serious war gamers. So everybody, thanks for coming on. I mean, fantastic. We've had almost 20 people on here for two hours consistently. And that's amazing. Know, really? Yeah. That's fantastic. And just uh, two yeah, 20 people want to listen to that. Yeah. I can't believe it. Um, Restless, thanks a lot for coming on. We, we kind of all, everybody, we did this kind of, well, not sort of last minute. Um, but fairly short time we put this together and I appreciate you coming on. You're my first guest in my new branding and my new stuff. And, um, and, and, oh, and your Christmas decorations in your video forever. I know it's beautiful. And one thing I failed to do is, you know, I've learned about this new tool. I, had. I should have put that up, but I didn't. So, well, you know, we're all learning here. So, um, yeah, you're welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate it. Um, it's awesome. Good comments. So, Here's the key, you know, get started. And if you know someone that's getting started, show them, show them modeling for advantages channel, show them my series on getting started. Um, there's a ton of, and there's just tons of videos about getting started in the, the hobby. It's not like I came up with something brand new there, but um, you know, someone will relate differently to each person. So it's awesome. Uh, thank you all for commenting. Have a great new year and, you know, we'll be back for more chitting and chatting. I'm sure we'll have Restless back on. We can talk about some other topics, maybe the French and early war and go two hours about that. So I like to talk history. That's more right. Than, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. That is something I want to spend more time on a little bit more history tied to the game somehow. So, okay, everybody. Thank you a lot. Stay on here. Restless. Don't hang up. Um, and we'll uh, talk to you all later. We'll see ya.